Okay. I think we're also live now, so that's good. So we can get started. Let me adjust one thing over here. I'm juggling multiple computers over here, but... Okay, cool. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I think we're broadcasting into multiple places right now. I can see people in the room. That's great. I see some of you are not keeping your social distance, but <laughs> that's... Wait a second, I'm hearing myself, so I'm going to turn this off. Okay, cool. Yeah, we'll try it out. Yeah, please try to keep your social distance. <laughs> I guess you know you who you are. Uh, how many people are in the room? Total, maybe Juan, can you tell us? 15 people. Okay, okay, that's great. Uh, we have a similar number on Zoom, I think. And I don't know how many people are on YouTube, uh, at least who are registered. But I think we'll try a different approach this time with the computer architecture course. Welcome, everyone. Uh, during the pandemic, extended pandemic times, let's say, uh, we're going to go hybrid this time. And the first lecture, well, all lectures will be like this, but sometimes I'll, I'll hope to be lecturing inside the real room physically as well. It didn't turn out today. We need to test that. Uh, but going forward, I think we're going to do some of the lectures in person, but we're going to still live stream them on Zoom as well as YouTube. And you'll have access to them afterwards also for if for some reason you're not going to be able to attend uh, the lecture, you can always see it on YouTube while you're doing whatever or afterwards, of course. Does that sound good to everyone? It'll be good to get feedback from the room. I have, I have you on my other computer over here. Okay, cool. And feel free to speak uh, as well. But I guess you need the microphone for that, right? If you want to ask a question. I assume, do you know uh, the procedure? Okay, maybe Juan, uh, can, you, can you explain how people can ask questions inside the room? We have a couple of <clears throat> microphones here in the room and uh, you just need to raise your hand and, and we will take, uh, bring you the, the microphone. So it should be easy. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. I guess we cannot use the built-in microphones into the room because that room should have built-in microphones. Yeah, it should be possible to use them as well. Okay, yeah. Yeah, maybe feel free to try it as well and let's see how it goes. I don't hear anything so far if people are speaking. I, I see they're trying to speak, but... <laughs> Okay, maybe we'll need to test that better. John, maybe uh, you, you and Juan can take a look at it during the break or uh, afterwards. It'd be good if people can interact uh, directly using those microphones. And I know uh, sitting with masks is not the most exciting thing to do, but yeah, this is the pandemic times. I'm not also forward to teaching with masks because it's not, it's not very nice, I think, but I'll, I'll try. Uh, and see how it goes. And you can see that I'm broadcasting from my office right now. It's not that far away. Uh, okay, but I think uh, with that said, and also I think if you want to ask questions on Zoom, uh, you can also ask on Zoom. We'll monitor the questions. I'll try to monitor the questions in one of the screens over here. Uh, and if you want to ask questions on YouTube, uh, please feel free to ask questions on YouTube also. Uh, if I uh, cannot get to it, hopefully my... Uh, scribes and TAs will alert me to any questions that may have been missed. And some of, the, some of the questions may be answered by them as well. So feel free to ask questions and uh, let's turn this course into more of a, uh, not just a lecture, but also a discussion uh, with clarifications, many questions, etc. So let's try to make the best out of uh, the multimodal nature of the course this time. And hopefully that's for the good. By the way, if you're inside the room, you can feel free to connect to Zoom also uh, if, if you want to ask questions that way, up to you. If you're shy or, uh, about speaking, for example, you can do that. <laughs> okay, uh, so let's get started. So uh, I think everyone is here for the computer architecture course, uh, the master's level course, although usually bachelor students also take it and PhD students take it as well, uh, given past experience. And today, this is the first lecture of the course. Uh, 
for um, and you know that we've already assigned some assignments during last week and hopefully you're doing some of those uh, and we're, I'm going to mention some of those in this course in this lecture as well but we're going to cover the introduction and the basics uh, basically uh, let me introduce myself uh, and after this I'm also going to ask uh, uh, the group uh, to in, uh, not to introduce themselves but turn on their camera so that hopefully everyone can see them uh, a lot of the TAs are online, maybe not all of them, uh, but I'll do that afterwards. Let me introduce the group basically who's uh, teaching the course. So I'm a full professor at ETH. I've been here for about six years now, I guess exactly six years now. Uh, before that, I was at Carnegie Mellon University for some time, uh, and my research group moved from there. Actually, we're, we're kind of in both places right now, so we've been doing this remote thing for a long time, uh, if you will. And uh, I got my PhD from UT Austin uh, about 15 years ago. And after that, I started the uh, computer architecture group at Microsoft Research. And we grew it into a nice shape. And after that, I moved to Carnegie Mellon University because I wanted to really teach and do research more freely, let's say. Uh, and during the course of my career, I worked at, many, uh, worked at and with many different companies. These include Google, VMware, Intel, AMD, and some others that uh, we have been working with, uh, both in terms of research and in other roles. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, that works better now. Uh, this is my website, my email, and uh, the works that we've been doing. My Gmail is the most reliable way to reach me. I would suggest using that. Uh, sometimes the ETH email has a very aggressive spam filter uh, that filters out email. So you may not be able to get through that spam filter. I don't know what the algorithms it employs are, but sometimes they're quite, it's quite, quite non-intuitive emails get uh, stuck in the spam filter, basically. That's an important topic also, clearly, but not as much related to computer architecture, clearly. So uh, I do research and teaching in computer architecture, computer systems, hardware security, and bioinformatics. And you will get exposed to a lot of these in this course. Uh, we do uh, work uh, a lot on memory and storage systems. And you will see that that's, uh, that's really uh, uh, the major bottleneck in existing systems. And this course being an advanced course, we're going to start uh, discussing uh, issues related to memory and storage systems a lot. Uh, and then uh, this, these are other areas that, do, uh, that we do research in hardware security, safety, predictability, fault tolerance, hardware software cooperation. I'm going to mention the importance of it in this lecture. Since this is going to be an overview lecture, uh, that's going to lead into uh, many of the topics that we're going to discuss in this course. And uh, we look a lot into architectures for bioinformatics, health, medicine, and of course, machine learning and artificial intelligence, uh, which is important today. But I, my, my interests are quite diverse and varied. Uh, I like tackling diffi difficult problems that uh, have high impact, hopefully, uh, in, in people's lives and computing platforms in general. And computing platforms are quite heavily integrated with people's lives today. Anything we improve in computing platforms improve, uh, hopefully improve, uh, improves people's lives. Okay, so that's me. Uh, and uh, this is uh, what I believe my current research uh, mission is, as well as my groups. We would like to build fundamentally better architectures. And you're in the right course if you're interested in that also, because we're going to talk a lot about uh, existing architectures, computing platforms. And we are going to also talk about how, how to make them better. We're not just going to focus on uh, what is done today. Uh, we also, uh, in common practice, but we also want to focus on what can be done better because in the end, that's the goal, right? If there's no progress, then there's no point in education, in a sense. The whole point of education, in my opinion, is progress, uh, both uh, from, a, from an individual's perspective, like you who are taking the courses, a personal growth perspective, and also from the world's perspective so that we can come to a better place. And that's uh, the reason for this, uh, let's say, grand research vision uh, that we have over here. And you can see the uh, topics at the top, but again, we're not limited to any of these topics. I'm interested in examining all parts of the system, including the software. Software is clearly not visible uh, in these hardware pieces, but uh, uh, we're interested in uh, really... Uh, solving problems across the computing stack, if you will, with computer architecture at the center. And you will see hopefully what this means a little bit more uh, as we continue uh, 
uh, in this lecture. Okay, so these are four key current directions that we are examining in my group. I would like to talk a little bit about uh, my philosophy and the group and what we're doing so that you can get a good perspective of what's coming because we do a lot of work on computer architecture. So the, uh, the, the, the research and education, in my opinion, are very coupled to each other and you will see that coupling uh, and you will see the mentality that leads to that coupling uh, based on what I will describe. Uh, so we are looking a lot into fundamentally secure, reliable, safe architectures. This is a really important problem today in computing systems in general. How do we make things more secure, more reliable, safer, more private? I don't include privacy over here, but that's also very important, especially when you want to process critical data that you don't want to expose to other people. And this is a big direction that we are following. And also we're going to touch upon this in different aspects of this course. And I think uh, whenever you think about different things in this course, we may not always cover the security aspects, for example, but uh, one of the things that I would like to achieve with this course is uh, to make you critical thinkers that uh, who can think on their own and who can question things and make things better by that critical thinking. So you can always think about uh, the question, what are the security implications of something that is proposed, some idea? That's an easy question to ask always. Reliability, safety, privacy, you can also ask the same question. But this is an important direction. Uh, certainly energy efficiency is a huge problem today, uh, not just in computing, but in general in the world. We have a huge climate crisis that is in part driven by uh, the energy hungry policies that uh, in general have been employed in the world. But from the computing perspective, we also have a problem because computers are employed everywhere and the energy they consume is really contributing to that climate problem. Uh, but of course they're doing useful work also. So we need to somehow make uh, computers a lot more energy efficient uh, while enabling them to be as high performance as possible at the same time. So currently we're at a point, we are reasonably good at performance. We can always do better as we will discuss in future lectures. But energy is a huge problem, basically. We're wasting a lot of energy, in my opinion. And we will see this a lot in this course also. Uh, basically, data is being moved around across the system a lot. And the, one of the key questions that we are going to examine uh, almost immediately, actually, maybe in lecture three, four, or five, I don't know. It, some of these will, will also dynamically be scheduled as well, uh, is uh, how to minimize the data movement as much as possible so that we can improve energy efficiency. And this leads us to more memory-centric or data-centric architectures that try not to move the data. And you can think of data movement as, for example, when you're uh, doing something on your cell phone, uh, you need to move some of the data to the cloud, right? So that because your cell phone is not powerful enough to process the data for whatever reason. And there's a lot of data movement that happens at the macro scale between computing devices, let's say. And there's also a lot of data movement that happens at the micro scale, meaning if you look at your own cell phone, inside the cell phone, uh, there's a big separation between processing units and memory units. And data has to move from the memory units, storage units, like a flash SSD or DRAM memory. Data has to move from uh, those memories into the processing elements first before you can process it. And that's a micro data movement. It's still important because you do it all the time, basically. There's no way today in existing systems to not move data process the data where it just sits, where it just resides. And that, uh, because data moment uh, over interconnects, energy hungry interconnects, is very energy inefficient, uh, this is contributing to the energy inefficiency significantly. And we will see this a lot in this course, including in this lecture, hopefully. I'm going a little bit uh, slower in the slides, uh, which is good, actually. Sometimes when I don't see uh, students watching, I, can, I tend to uh, go faster. But now that I see your faces in the room, that's much better. Okay, so, so energy efficiency is important, but keep in mind that energy efficiency uh, is not, uh, is, it also includes performance, meaning we don't want to give up performance because performance has enabled us to do many, many things, including the machine learning revolution, uh, whatever we are doing right now. Uh, we, we are able to do this, all, the, all of this video streaming and coding, decoding because of uh, the performance. So uh, performance and energy efficiency are tightly coupled in the end. Okay, we're also working on low latency and predictable architectures, how to make systems more predictable, lower latency, uh, faster response time. This is especially important in medical applications, for example, or even AI, AI uh, machine learning applications like self-driving cars. Clearly, you don't want uh, 
longer or unpredictable latencies to detect a pedestrian, for example, especially if you're in a complex situation, right? And I think this is one of the key challenges in computing systems, uh, certainly going into the future. How do you ensure that uh, you can have a predictable latency in your tasks uh, so that you can stay safe, let's say, right? This has a critical implication of safety for sure. And the last direction uh, is uh, architectures for artificial intelligence, machine learning, genomics, medicine, health, and any important application that matters. Graph analytics happens to be another one, in my opinion, over here, because graph analytics is used in many, many uh, domains, including machine learning, genomics, uh, and many, many other applications like databases, for example. Uh, but this is a direction where you design specialized architectures or semi-specialized architectures for important applications. So for example, if we could give uh, some important uh, uh, platform for genome analysis uh, to the hands of a doctor or even a patient, and they can analyze their genomes and get recommendations very quickly, that would be great, right? And specialized architectures enable that sort of dream, let's say, where you can have uh, a nice device that can analyze your genome and give you recommendations, for example, for your medicine or or the treatment that you're supposed to receive, maybe automatically or in consultation with a doctor, right? Uh, uh, so I think uh, specialization is important for this sort of purposes because that enables you to be very energy efficient at the same time, very high performance because you're really customizing the entire system uh, for a specialized application. Okay, uh, and I think these, all of these are related to each other, of course, as I mentioned, some of the relations uh, earlier. But we're going to cover a lot of these also in this talk, uh, about not in this talk per se, but in this uh, class, we're going to touch upon different aspects. And um, I would like you to think about the slide, perhaps, when we uh, think about different things. And feel free to ask questions related to, for example, energy implications uh, of something, because we will not have enough time to cover all implications of an idea, right? We'll discuss a lot of ideas, and the ideas always have trade-offs. Uh, every single idea has a pro and a con, at least one pro and one con, usually more than one. Uh, and we will not be able to cover every single aspect of an idea uh, because there are many different metrics with which you can evaluate uh, an idea. Okay, uh, so this brings me to the transformation hierarchy. You may have seen this if you have especially taken the digital design and computer architecture course or watched it online uh, that we deliver. Uh, I like this uh, slide. Uh, basically, uh, computers are there to solve problems and problems get solved by electrons. Unfortunately, we do not have a direct way of expressing a problem into the electron language, right? That's why we have built this transformation hierarchy where the problem gets translated to an algorithm, algorithm gets expressed in a programming language, and then it gets run on some uh, hardware through the help of the system software and the software hardware interface, which is computer architecture, and the implementation of it which in turn gets implemented using logic gates, which in turn get implemented using devices, which in turn get implemented using uh, the principles of physics, like electrons, right? And this is a nice way of looking at the computing stack. And uh, clearly computer architecture uh, from a narrow-minded perspective uh, sits in the interface as well as the microarchitecture, basically the hard hardware software interface, the instructions and the implementation of it. But in this course, we're gonna take a much wider interface based on what I just talked about, uh, basically, we're going to uh, essentially we're going to take uh, an expanded view, I call it, uh, where we co-design across the hierarchy from algorithms all the way to devices. You can customize the algorithm to the devices, and you can potentially customize the devices to potential algorithms, and you can do any kind of optimization in between. Uh, and this leads us to much more efficient and high-performance architectures. And that's my axiom over here. And we're going to see uh, this many, many times, hopefully, in this course, but. If you would like to achieve the highest energy efficiency and performance, uh, you must, we must take the expanded view uh, today. And we're, this is going to become more clear uh, with some of the things that we will discuss. Uh, uh, and basically, we would like to co-design across the hierarchy from algorithms to devices and specialize as much as possible within the design goals. And I think this is going to be increasingly more important going into the future. Of course, this doesn't mean that there are no ideas out there that just optimize at one layer, like microarchitecture, for example, or logic or you come up with a new transistor. Uh, uh, but uh, so clearly those are good ideas as well, but uh, uh, we're going to take a broader approach to architecture in this course. Okay, so I'm not going to cover this slide a lot, but these are some of the more detailed research directions that are happening 
uh, in my group. Uh, and again, we're going to touch a lot of this in this course, because these are also important reactions that are happening in computer architecture in general and computing system designs in, uh, even, in even more general. But uh, hopefully you, you see the mindset. We'd like to do broad research spanning application systems logic with computer architecture at the center. And let me introduce uh, the group uh, a little bit also. This is uh, the group website. You can find information there. And this is the group motto uh, my students wrote over here. Uh, let me see. I don't know what happened. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's moving a bit slowly. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you can see this is an incarnation of the group in 2020, I think. And we have some newsletters. Uh, and this is a more pandemic oriented incarnation of the group and a more recent newsletter. We'll have another newsletter coming up soon. Uh, and I think maybe this is a good time to ask uh, my students and postdocs to turn on their cameras so that people can see them. Can you see everyone? Okay, I see. Yeah, please everyone, whoever is here uh, as TAs. Not everyone is here uh, due to other commitments, but you can see a bunch of uh, the TAs and people which you will, who, whom you will get to interact with uh, over the course of uh, these lectures. And they will help you uh, with labs, assignments, et cetera. Let me see. I guess I, guess I can go quickly uh, and introduce them. And other, I guess other people on Zoom, feel free to turn on your cameras as well so that <laughs> uh, other uh, people can see each other uh, as part of the class. You don't have to, especially if it's embarrassing or inconvenient, but feel free to do, uh, do that. But I see, uh, I mean, you can see Juan and Joao in the room, for example. Uh, Juan is uh, the head TA, uh, along with Mohammed, uh, whom you can see in the camera. And there's Geraldo, I see. I'm just going through the Zoom order over here that I see on my screen. There's Jisung, uh, Rakesh, uh, well, who's taking the course also, I think, <laughs> but he's been working with us too. Noor, uh, Lois, uh, John, uh, Gagan, Hayu, Nika, Roknodden. And I guess I don't see anyone else on my screen. Yeah, I think feel free to keep your cameras on, turned on, uh, up to you. Uh, I'll, I'll let you decide. But I think it's good to uh, do that, especially when we're discussing something in the room so that people everywhere can see each other. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna move on. Uh, well, uh, I can talk a lot about my group, but uh, we have been working on computer architecture for a while. And uh, you can see uh, the PhD and postdoc alumni uh, that we have graduated. This doesn't include the masters and bachelors and high school uh, alumni, of course, but uh, this is what fits on one page for now. Uh, and uh, tomorrow, actually, one of uh, uh, my students, uh, Minesh Patel, who's also going to be involved in this course for some time at least, is going to be defending his dissertation uh, at 5 p.m. So uh, you, can, you, can, you can also come to that if you're interested. Okay, uh, there's a lot more. You can, you can, you can see uh, these slides online also, some of these slides. But uh, one of the things, I, if, uh, this is not required, but if you're interested in uh, research in general, uh, I recently recorded this uh, video as part of the uh, architecture mentoring workshop in the major computer architecture conference, ISCA conference. Uh, and uh, I've essentially uh, described my advice on how to do impactful research uh, and also how to approach uh, research uh, in general. Uh, and I believe actually these are also principles for uh, success in life as well, as Richard Hamming puts it uh, when he describes uh, you and your research. Uh, uh, so if you're interested in this, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd highly recommend uh, watching this video. This also gives a more deeper introduction to the research group, but you will see that in the lectures too. Okay, uh, so uh, I mentioned that uh, I'm a strong believer in teaching and research uh, conducted uh, in a synergistic way. And this slide summarizes that I think teaching drives research and research drives teaching. And this is an endless loop, if you will. And this is the loop that I could put on my slide. Uh, you can keep repeating this basically. Uh, but uh, the, what, what do I mean by this? I think uh, education and research are tightly coupled, especially if you want to do cutting edge, if you want to be at the cutting edge of something, 
if you want to innovate, if you want to make progress. Uh, education is really teaching someone, uh, well, in addition to other aspects like personal enabling personal growth, et cetera, inquisitiveness, et cetera. It's really uh, teaching someone what uh, is very well known, right? Or almost very well known. It's out there, basically. You can figure it out. You can find it out. Uh, but you enable a way for people to get it and learn it in an organized manner. So that's teaching or education in my view. But research is almost exactly the same, except you just venture into the unknown, right? Research is doing something that's new and then educating everyone about it, basically. But in that sense, there is not much difference between them, except the difference is large in the sense that you have to take that leap to enable something new in research. But once you enable something new, it becomes education because that becomes the body that becomes part of the body of knowledge that anyone can access at that point, right? That's why these are not that uh, different from each other and they're very tightly coupled from each other, except the methods for research are different from methods for teaching, of course. Uh, okay, I'm not gonna philosophize more of this, but uh, the reason I'm mentioning this is in all of our courses, uh, we take this approach basically. We don't just talk about uh, what is very well known, but we also talk about what is going on in the research and what, what you can potentially do to actually improve the state of the art in research and, and do better, essentially design better systems uh, going into the future. So hopefully, uh, hopefully this mindset uh, uh, affects you a little bit as well, because I think this is really uh, good for progress in general. Okay, uh, let me quickly go, I mean, that's why we actually release a lot of our lectures online and you can find these and you can find uh, clearly this course online also as it happens. Uh, on our YouTube site. Uh, but some of you uh, may have taken the uh, computer architecture and digital design course, BDCA essentially. And I see some uh, people may have done that in the past, but some of you may not have taken it. If, if you find yourself uh, maybe lacking background on something, I would recommend uh, visiting uh, the di digital design and computer architecture course. This is a freshman level course at ETH, uh, meaning the first year course, second semester course. Uh, but it's, it's, it gives a rigorous introduction to digital design and computer architecture. And some of you may have seen some of these slides earlier, actually. So I apologize if they're boring, but not everyone is in the same uh, standing in this course because there are some people who take this computer architecture course after they take uh, the digital design and computer architecture course. So the introductory material is going to be very similar, if you will, except this is going to be more advanced. So we're not going to deal with digital design in this course, for example. But there are quite a few people also who have not taken the digital design and computer architecture course. For those, I would recommend going through uh, those materials. Uh, and then clearly advanced computer architecture is this uh, course, even though it's not called advanced, even though it's called just computer architecture, it's clearly advanced compared to uh, the first course. Okay, and you can find the uh, latest incarnation of digital design and computer architecture online. Uh, you can see if uh, any of the materials is useful for you. In fact, for the first uh, lab assignments on caching, uh, if you're not familiar with caching for whatever reason, uh, which is a bit surprising because uh, you should have taken some computer architecture course somewhere and usually caching is covered. But for some reason it's not covered, uh, then I would recommend watching the lectures from Digital Design and Computer Architecture, uh, which are updated in the latest revision in 2021. Uh, I think they're, uh, they're significantly better than the earlier revisions uh, uh, in terms of uh, what they provide. Okay, and this is, the, uh, this is the previous incarnation of the course you're taking currently. Uh, so if you want to see, uh, get an idea of what the schedule uh, may look like uh, this semester, you can also take a look at the past incarnation and uh, get yourself familiar. You don't have to watch clearly because you're gonna take the course, but feel free to also refer to that material uh, from past years. In fact, uh, a lot of the homeworks that we're going to have, a lot of the labs we're going to have are going to be very, very similar uh, uh, to the past incarnation. And also the paper reviews that we're going to have uh, are going to be very similar to the past incarnation. So you'll have a lot of resources uh, to uh, potentially uh, go back and look and also uh, potentially predict what's going to come next uh, in this course, because this course structure has not changed as much, except it gets updated every year. For example, last year uh, was the first time we discussed uh, some uh, really important advancements in uh, Rohammer, for example. Rohammer, we're going to talk about Rohammer 
uh, it's been a problem that we have been working on for seven years. Uh, but uh, last year, we incorporated into the course some very recent advances like Trespass and Revisiting Rob Hammer that we did not have in past incarnations of this course. So the course is very dynamic. Cutting edge research gets integrated into the course and sometimes topics change slightly, but uh, you, will, uh, you will get a, a good sense if you look at uh, last year's website as to what might happen this year. Okay, and we also have a seminar course, which you may have taken. Uh, and if you're interested, uh, that also gives you a rigorous introduction on presenting papers, reading papers, which you will get exposed to, except you will not present in this particular uh, course. In this course, you're gonna read a lot of papers. Some of them will be required. A lot of them will be extra credit. So uh, on your own, you can do readings and these are essentially going to be extra credit. I, I think of them as free points, if you will, because if you do uh, reviews, you can uh, significantly advance your grade without relying too much on the exam, uh, if you will. So if you're not a great exam taker, uh, there are other ways of actually uh, doing well in this course. Uh, and I would recommend you uh, to think about that uh, and know that uh, as early as possible, like right now at the beginning, right? And as, as you may have seen in Hamming, uh, Hamming's you and your research uh, transcript, that was one of the required uh, readings. I don't know if you've done it yet or not, uh, but uh, Hamming in that reading says uh, one of the most important things uh, for a good researcher to know is to know themselves, basically. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? What can you improve on? And if you know that your weaknesses is not good exam taking, this course is not very heavy on the exam to begin with, but you can still make up for the lost points, let's say, in the exam by doing a lot of these extra credit assignments, which directly impact your final grade. I know in an advanced course like this, grades are not as important, but I know that uh, students sometimes have the mentality of putting a bit more importance on the grades, and I understand that also, but there are ways to actually uh, compensate for things in the advanced course like this. Uh, well, at least in this course, I don't know about all the other advanced courses. So hopefully that's clear. Okay, uh, I guess, is there a question in the room in the back or no? Okay, yeah, I think uh, they're putting their thing. Okay, we also have some projects and seminar courses, and if you're interested, you can also take them. Uh, these are uh, open to bachelor students in the E department, uh, or I should call it ECE department because it's really an ECE department, even though it's uh, called EE, uh, electrical and computer engineering, I should say. Okay, so let me cover some of these principles that we're going to hopefully try to incorporate and employ in this course. And we also do employ in our research, uh, just to give you some familiarity uh, in terms of uh, my, like my mindset, and also hopefully the mindset of uh, the other TAs, and also hopefully a good mindset that I believe is useful in general uh, to be successful in research and life. Uh, so uh, a lot of uh, what we focus on in research and also teaching is insight, basically. Uh, in the end, research is really hunt for new insight. Uh, if you want to be a researcher, you're always hunting for some new insight that nobody knew about, or you, you want to verify some old insight, right? And we're going to focus a lot on insight. Uh, in this course, focus a lot on ideas, which used to be new at some point, but some of them are not going to be new. Some of them are going to be relatively new in terms of when they're presented and when they're published, let's say. And I encourage you to do both as well. Uh, try to uh, get to the heart of some idea and figure out what's the insight that is provided by this paper, for example, or by this design, for example. And I also encourage you to develop new ideas as much as possible. I think uh, in the end, again, our goal is progress, and it's not possible without uh, new ideas. And we focus a lot on learning and scholarship. And I think this course is structured that way so that uh, you can do a lot uh, of learning, uh, both on your own and also in lectures, and hopefully in discussions as well. So that's why I would like to encourage you to ask questions as much as possible during the course. This is different from, so if you've taken digital design and computer architecture, you've handled a lot of questions over there, of course, but uh, it's a bit different from digital design and computer architecture that this is more advanced, right? So uh, we would like to focus a lot more on learning and uh, a lot on learning and scholarship. And we're going to read a lot of papers also. So think about uh, their contribution to learning and scholarship. Okay. Uh, I will also mention over here, uh, a lot of the activities we do are actually motivated by uh, uh, these principles, let's say. And uh, one of the things that we have recently started taking advantage of the pandemic times, let's say, 
are these live seminars where uh, we invite people from Safari or uh, outsiders as well to give talks on important topics in computer architecture. Uh, these are all online, uh, they're live streamed, and I invite you to also look at them as much as you have time. Uh, you can find some of these older seminars over here, as you can see. Uh, there are really interesting topics like processing in memory, which we will cover in this lecture. Uh, this second seminar was about uh, uh, by, by an industry veteran, Dr. Andrew Walker, on an addiction to low cost per memory bit, how to recognize then what to do about it. Uh, I like this topic, and we're going to talk about that also within the context of memories in this course. And I'm not going to go over all of these uh, here, but you can see that there, there are some recent seminars. By the way, I mentioned that uh, my PhD student, Minesh Patel, is uh, going to defend his dissertation tomorrow, but this is a live seminar he delivered uh, a couple of weeks ago on essentially his dissertation topic. Uh, so if you're interested in what he has done, uh, you can take a look at it. And there's also one upcoming live seminar uh, by Javad on uh, a really important and uh, cutting edge topic, if you will. Uh, and the topic is going to be security implications of power management mechanisms in modern processors. Uh, it talks about some current studies and future trends. So if you're interested in hardware security, uh, this would be a good talk to attend because he's going to present some of our very recent work called iChannels that basically enable covert channels uh, in processors due to the current management mechanisms. Uh, and I'm, I'm not going to go into details, but you can watch it. Uh, I don't want to spoil it right now, but it's a very fascinating topic. By managing voltage and current in existing systems, uh, uh, systems existing systems manage voltage and current dynamically. For example, if you're a very power hungry in instruction, uh, you may need to reduce the current to some other core. Uh, and reduce the activity in some other core so that you can execute this very power hungry instruction on this core. And what could be a power hungry instruction? It could be a, a AVX instruction, a SIMD instruction, for example, a very powerful instruction. And once you do that, now you're really creating a covert channel that someone can eavesdrop on because you're really affecting how fast the instructions are executed in some other core or some other thread because you're executing power hungry instructions in this particular thread. So that's very interesting. And uh, this, uh, this talk and the associated paper deals with that. And if you're interested in this, uh, I'd recommend looking at it. And today, hardware security is extremely important. There are many, many such covert channels or side channels, and also reliability, and, uh, reliability issues that could lead to security problems. And if you don't have a very good way of fixing these problems in a methodical manner, if you will, we don't know how to deal with side channels completely today. You may have heard about Meltdown and Spectre, for example, I'm going to also briefly mentioned them, hopefully later in this uh, lecture. Uh, but Meltdown and Spectre are just two examples. There are many, many other security issues uh, arising from uh, the microarchitecture and the design of the hardware. And if you don't take security into account when you design, for example, uh, the current management mechanisms, then somebody will exploit it, basically. Somebody can get to your private data uh, by essentially figuring out how to extract information from this covert channel because the processor is manipulating the current and the voltage based on the instructions that are executed in some other threat, right? Okay, uh, so hopefully that's interesting. We're gonna cover similar issues and we may actually have some guest lectures like this in this talk, uh, in this class also. In the, traditionally, we've had a bunch of guest lectures on cutting edge research topics. Uh, for example, last incarnation of this course, we had a guest lecture from IBM Research Zurich, uh, Abu Sebastian, who talked about in-memory computing using emerging memory technologies like phase change memory. We're gonna talk about emerging memory technologies and in-memory computing. We're gonna combine them together and you, you can get an industrial perspective on that as well. Hopefully that'll be interesting. But uh, my point over here is that you can, you can also watch these online on your own without uh, uh, having to get someone into the course. Okay. Uh, this is another uh, important, let's say, uh, mindset, if you will. Uh, we open source a lot in my group, and I think this is really important for progress into the future. You're going to work with some of these open source uh, works, and you can find some of these open source, uh, actually all of these open source works in our GitHub. Uh, and you can see that uh, there are a bunch of things that are open sourced. Ramulator is a DRAM simulator uh, that uh, we have open source. It's widely used by industry and academia uh, to do cutting edge research, as well as designs in main memory. Uh, we also release benchmarks 
uh, for processing in memory, for example. And you can see some, some other things that are going to be released very soon because they have uh, not been officially published yet, let's say. But they're already released, actually, but they're not fully documented, as you can see over here. But I'd recommend uh, taking a look at it. Clearly, uh, Rohammer, uh, we have released a lot of work on Rohammer, and this is an older slide, if you will. Somehow, I, I, I remember fixing the slide, but that's okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, you can find a lot more open source tools. And I would recommend, uh, why am I talking about this? Uh, partially, you will get, uh, you will use some of these tools, but partially, I would also like to uh, inject, let's say, the mentality that open sourcing is a good thing because it enables broad progress across the world. Uh, if, if you're a researcher keeping everything to yourself, uh, I think that's not necessarily a good thing because, uh, first of all, uh, open sourcing enables reproducibility of the research. Uh, if you're keeping it to yourself, how is it going to be really reproducible? That's a problem. And second, uh, open sourcing enables progress uh, in research as well as uh, development. And again, if you keep something to yourself, uh, the, the amount of progress you enable is going to be much lower uh, than otherwise. Okay, so that's why we make everything as much as possible available uh, to, to our best uh, uh, effort, let's say. Uh, clearly, sometimes we collaborate with industry uh, in a very tight manner where we actually examine their products and also uh, change their products. And uh, that is done under non-disclosure agreements. Sometimes we cannot open source everything because of that reason. But if, if such a reason doesn't prevent us, we almost always open source uh, our work. And you can find all of the open source works and the papers and the lectures, et cetera, online. Okay, well, let me give you some more of these principles and then we're gonna take a break. But this is a, an important principle, I think, uh, that I will try to uh, enable in this course as well. I try to enable this in my group, uh, but also in this course, I would like to have it. Uh, hopefully we will have an environment here as well that values free exploration, openness, collaboration, hard work, and creativity. And I think all of these aspects are important to me. And uh, we try to accomplish this in my group. And I would like you to be openly, expressing your ideas in this course, for example, hopefully collaborating with each other uh, on, the, uh, on any issues. Like uh, I, I don't have a problem if you collaborate with uh, each, uh, each other on homeworks, et cetera. Uh, with, with purely online mode, this may have been difficult, but right now uh, you can come in into the class once in a while, show your face on Zoom, et cetera, and find collaborations as well. Uh, and, I'm not, uh, and hopefully exercise your creativity as well. I'm not going to be shy about it. It's going to be hard work. No question about that. There's a lot that we're going to cover, but hopefully it's going to be worth it. Okay, so some suggestions uh, that I have uh, based on uh, these principles. I, I would say uh, following your passion is important. Uh, of course, your passion needs to be kind of guided to do something important and big, uh, but that important thing, following that important thing is important and uh, you can easily get derailed because there could be a lot of people who can say, oh, you cannot do this, you cannot do that. You may have a big idea and people can say, oh, that's never going to work. That should be all the more reason for you to actually uh, focus on it and enable it. Of course, you need to be uh, not, not a fanatic about it. Uh, it's, it's good to be realistic, but let's say realistically passionate about your idea as opposed to fanatically passionate about your idea. And the difference between that, those two is if you're realistically passionate, then you can take into account all of the good feedback that comes in and make your idea better and enable it to have much higher impact. Whereas if you are fanatically passionate, then you may, not be able, you may, you may be missing a lot of the good feedback, right? That's the big difference. Uh, but a lot of big ideas have, enabled, uh, have been enabled because people have followed their passions. And I'm going to give you examples uh, 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 as, as we go along. I, I think even, even the example of uh, uh, multimedia extensions at Intel, for example, which enabled a lot of the AVX extensions, SIMD extensions across the board, uh, how do you get it incorporated into the instructions at architecture? People had to fight a lot internally at Intel uh, to make sure that uh, they, they, they can convince others that multimedia extensions in 1990s are important to include in an instruction set architecture so that they can accelerate video and image processing applications. This is 1990s, right? And uh, people are saying, these extensions, we put them in, uh, nobody's going to use them. 
why are we dealing with that? And how do you deal with that? Well, you can, you can always say, okay, you're right and give up. And then you cannot enable multimedia extensions, right? But clearly in hindsight, we know how important these multimedia extensions have been in, in accelerating workloads like video, audio, and later as we will see genome analysis as well. Uh, uh, but you need to follow your passion and make things happen in general, if you're a researcher, but even if you're a product developer, if you're in development, uh, if you don't follow your passion, you may not actually get your, uh, get things done. And this is one of the uh, things that are also that is also emphasized in um, Richard Hamming's uh, talk, uh, Richard Hamming's talk transcript that I uh, like asked you to read. Uh, he gives examples of uh, making things happen as well. I'm going to maybe potentially give you uh, some other examples that talk about this, but I think this is important. And I think uh, if you want to enable your passion, you need to uh, usually work hard. Uh, and working hard usually comes with building infrastructure. Basically, you need to demonstrate that your idea is worth something. And for that, you usually need to build infrastructure. And we have done it. Uh, I'm going to give you examples in our research. We've done a lot of infrastructure building, like the Rowhammer research that we have done. We built experimental infrastructures for... Uh, testing of memories. We're going to talk about that. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have projects related to it in this course, but in some projects and seminars courses, we have projects. In this course, it's not a very scalable, uh, uh, but maybe we'll, have, we'll, we'll find a way to scale. But building infrastructure is important. Uh, as you can also see in Hamming's uh, transcript, he mentions Edison, uh, Thomas Edison saying, uh, like research is 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration. Right, 99% of the time you work hard so that you can actually get that 1% inspiration or pearl realized. Okay, yeah, I guess this is another way of putting it basically, building infrastructure and working hard, but clearly working hard is a grander thing than building infrastructure. And I think being resilient is really important if you want to get your ideas across. And again, uh, there's no other way of really doing uh, good science than focusing on learning and scholarship. And this is really important in the end. Again, I think if you do all of these right, uh, the quality of your work really will define your impact. And the higher the quality is, the better uh, your impact will be on the world. And I think, I believe in every, everybody who is taking this course and also has taken my past courses, everybody with the mind, right mindset uh, can actually accomplish uh, outstanding impact on the world uh, by doing something better, improving something and enabling progress. But again, I think a lot of this boils down to mindsets, good mindset, good goals, good focus. That's why I'm mentioning this at the, at the beginning to you uh, so that we can actually uh, have uh, some of these principles employed in this course as well. And who knows, in the past, people who have taken uh, my courses have done really interesting uh, research projects uh, and have, have actually have a, had a good impact on the world. I can give examples, but maybe I'll leave it to uh, when we actually talk about the topics. Okay, with that, I think uh, uh, I mentioned that we put a lot of uh, things online. These are some of the things that you may want to look at. I, I already mentioned one of these things. I think a later version of this intelligent architectures for intelligent systems talk. Hopefully, some hopefully people have watched it. Uh, just just to see hands, how many people have watched the lecture that I asked you to watch? Okay, I see some hands, but not all hands. Okay, some people are also raising hands. That's good. No problem, that's fine. I think uh, this is going to be part of your homework anyway. And I think it's going to be an easy watch after you watch this lecture, uh, these initial lectures anyway. But feel free to watch other lectures. But uh, again, you don't have to because we're going to cover a lot of things in this course. These are just individual lecturized versions of uh, lectures that are coming from this course. Okay, so if you're interested in more of my thoughts and suggestions on research, etc., you can feel free to uh, watch other things. and. My favorite, uh, well, I think these are all good uh, videos, et cetera, but uh, one of my favorites is this interview that uh, uh, two, uh, two PhD students uh, did with me uh, at, uh, at the International Symposium on Computer Architecture in 2019, before the pandemic times, where they asked a lot of really good questions and hopefully uh, it, was a, it was a fun interview uh, for people to see. And you can also see a very short version of something like that. Okay. Uh, hmm. somehow, okay, I lost track of my slides. Okay, and uh, I think you can also watch this uh, that I mentioned that talks about doing impactful research. And related to this, uh, I mean, I clearly gave this in 2021, even though the date is wrong over here, as you can see, that should be 2021. 
there's some inconsistency on the slide, as you can see. Uh, this was uh, a similar thing was written, uh, not written, delivered as a speech by Richard Hamming. Richard Hamming is uh, clearly has done a lot of contributions to research. He invented the Hamming codes. Uh, he invented error correcting codes. Uh, uh, essentially, he invented coding theory as we know it uh, today. And uh, he worked at Bell Labs for a lot of his career. And in this transcript that I recommend, uh, uh, essentially, he describes his approach to doing high impact research. And I agree with a lot of the things he says over here. Uh, that's why I wanted you to do this reading as the first reading of the course. I'm going to require also uh, uh, you to do a review of this. It's, it's fun. There's also a video of it. Actually, the video uh, of uh, not this particular lecture not from 1986, but from 1995, uh, based on a seminar series that actual lecture series that he delivered at the university, I think. Uh, you can also look at the video, but I think uh, reading the transcript is better because uh, every time someone delivers a talk, it's usually different. In 1995, when I watched the video, it's different from, slightly different from uh, this particular transcript over here. They, all, they both have good sites. I can assign both, but I decided to assign this transcript. But feel free to watch the video as well. And uh, there are a lot of good recommendations over here. For example, uh, I think one of, the, one of the other things that I believe in is uh, if you don't have a lot of resources, for example, to do some research, uh, then uh, the right approach is not to cry about it. <laughs> the approach is really to formulate uh, the research problem such that you can take advantage of the a situation where you don't have enough resources, right? And that has enabled a lot of interesting research. Right? By reformulating the problem, you can actually uh, do uh, a lot of interesting things. For example, in this uh, talk, Hamming says that, okay, he wanted to work on programming, but he didn't have the resources to do programming uh, uh, in wh wherever he was in Bell Labs. But Bell Labs had a lot of good people. So he didn't want to leave Bell Labs also because he wanted to be around the good people. So he reformulated the problem that he wanted to work on, not just uh, making software better, but he said, can we automate the programming? So essentially, this is uh, sometime in 19, 1960s, for example, can we automate the programming of uh, devices at the time? So you can read uh, the, this, this particular uh, uh, transcript, and I, I hope you can internalize it as well, because I, I actually uh, read it once in a while, and I always uh, find new gems and important things to introspect about, not just as a researcher, but uh, as, as, a, as a human uh, who's interested in succeeding, right? In fact, uh, in, in, in his 1995 talk uh, online on YouTube, you can find it. Uh, Richard Hamming says, uh, these are really just principles of success, in my opinion, as opposed to principles of being a good researcher. Of course, they are uh, synergistic with each other. Okay, that's why we have this uh, required reading. Okay, given these principles, I also wanted to give you uh, an overview of like how you can best approach this course going into the future lectures. These are some comments from past uh, uh, takers of this course, let's say. People thought it was a formative experience, high investment, high return. And I agree with that. A lot of people complained that uh, we need more credits, but uh, yeah, I cannot do much about it. I think, I don't know if you can get more credits. I will look into it, uh, but uh, yeah, hopefully, Hopefully you can get something beyond the credits out of this course as well. Uh, yeah, this was a more recent feedback related to uh, the purely YouTube or pu not purely YouTube, like purely online version of this course. I don't like the purely online version, frankly. That's why we're going hybrid this time. And the situation allows us to go, go kind of hybrid. But I think there is a benefit to having recorded lectures. And this is a feedback that I've gotten since 2012 or so when I started recording my lectures online and putting them online. And this is, I think, very useful. It enables essentially asynchronous uh, learning, if you will. Yeah, I think some people like their TVs also, as you can see. <laughs> I don't know. Feel free to basically, basically, there's no, uh, uh, try to customize uh, this course to your way of learning. That's my point in presenting these. And if it allows you to watch your lectures on your TV, feel free to do that. No problem with me, basically. Uh, if it allows you to uh, watch the lectures, uh, like 10 days after they're delivered. Again, feel free to do that, although you may get a little bit late uh, uh, in the material. Okay, 
Yeah, I think uh, this is uh, this is a comment that I wanted to emphasize. Feel free to ask questions and remarks, uh, and uh, we'll try to be as much as uh, possible responsive to everything on Zoom, YouTube, etc. And also uh, in person, please uh, feel free to talk. Okay, I'm not sure if I agree with this, but some people found it better than in-person cl classes. I think there's certainly benefits to both approaches, uh, meaning uh, certainly uh, online you can ask questions asynchronously. If we can get to the questions, and we usually do, we can answer them. Uh, but uh, in-person interaction is also important, I think. That's why I'll try to deliver some of the lectures online. And that's why uh, we have uh, TAs in class also uh, for those of you who would like to attend. Uh, the class in person. Okay, yeah, we were here. Yeah, I think uh, some people like the formats. Usually people uh, complained about the heavy workload, uh, but hopefully uh, we'll try to reduce the workload uh, and make a lot of extra credit, more extra credits than in the past, uh, but we will not change the format because uh, the format really enables you to learn, in my opinion, uh, with lectures uh, and homework and labs. We will insert more discussion sessions also uh, uh, to so that that can help you with the labs and homework uh, better as we go along, based on the feedback that we received in the past. Okay, but the hands-on learning that we have in the labs is really important, in my opinion. Okay, I think another comment is paper reviews. Uh, people usually liked it; they found uh, those to be a lot. Uh, but again, a lot of them are extra credit. You don't have to do everything that is given as extra credit. Feel free to do it as much as you have time. Uh, I mean, labs are required, but, but again, if, you, uh, if you're, uh, let's say, points-oriented, if you lose some points in labs, uh, or if you, for whatever reason, you cannot get to do a lab, uh, you can always make it up with paper reviews. I should, I should put it that way. That's, so uh, keep, uh, be informed that there are multiple ways of uh, really succeeding in this course. Uh, and also, uh, uh, I, I should mention that labs... Uh, uh, you can submit them anytime until the end of the semester, any lab. But of course, it's better to do them as we give them to you. But if for some reason you cannot do uh, some labs, you can do them later on. Okay. Yeah. Some, somebody was quite enthusiastic, as you can see. I, I'm not sure if I would take any course I've taken in my life again. <laughs> uh, although I, sometimes it's a good idea to do that, but uh, some people really liked it. Okay, so I think uh, from my perspective, I would like this to be a learning experience uh, for you. Everything that we have in this course, take it as a learning experience, even the difficulty of it. Even that is a learning experience. And uh, Richard Hamming, I think, puts it nicely in some of the examples that he gives. Everything really is a learning experience. And hopefully, uh, the, the impact of this course will be seen in the long term. And the trade-off analysis uh, that we do in this course on any idea the methodical way of approaching any idea uh, is hopefully going to be useful for you in anything you do out there uh, in the real world, let's say, whatever job you have. Because in the end, uh, you're going to be thrown uh, problems if you're doing something interesting in your job and you need to do some sort of trade-off analysis. And that sort of trade-off analysis is really important uh, if, you, if you're methodical about it, if you're critically thinking about things, and if you develop your decision-making skills based on uh, different designs, for example. So basically, this is what I would like you to get out of this course uh, over the semester. And I think your mindset will determine what you get out of the course in the end, uh, because yes, there's a lot that we will offer you, but uh, hopefully you will approach it also in a nice way so that you can get the best out of it. And also, I cannot personalize the course for everyone. Everybody has a different way of learning, clearly. We're all different individuals. We're, we're all very diverse individuals. And everybody has... Uh, uh, strengths and weaknesses in different forms of learning. So I think I would like you to think about what is the best way you can learn from this course and use the best tactics, if you will, and customize what we have to uh, how you can learn. And I think that's best done uh, by uh, yourself introspecting on how you can learn the best. Okay, because there are multiple opportunities, as I said, uh, and you can, you, can, you can put your focus on different parts of the course also. Okay, that's, what, that's one of the reasons why I uh, put this uh, reading as required reading, because more than anything else, this reading is all about mindset and also other things, of course. Okay, this is Richard Hamming, by the way. Uh, and I think maybe I'll read this quickly before uh, we take a break, but 
uh, he says that if you really want to be a first class scientist, you need to know yourself, know your weaknesses, your strengths, and your bad faults, like my egotism. He criticized himself also, as you can see. How can you convert a fault to an asset? How can you convert a situation where you haven't got enough manpower to move into a direction when that's exactly what you need to do? I say again that I have seen, as I studied the history, the successful scientists changed the viewpoints, meaning they changed how they approach things. And what was a defect became an asset. In summary, I claim that some of the reasons why so many people have, who have greatness within their grasp don't succeed are they don't work on important problems. We didn't talk about that, but we kind of mentioned that important problems are really critical. They don't become emotionally involved. They don't try and change what is difficult to some other situation, which is easily done, but st is still important. Meaning if you don't have the resources, revise it, uh, revise the problem statement so that you can actually solve the problem really in the end. And they keep giving themselves alibis why they don't. Basically, they give excuses why they don't succeed, let's say. They keep saying that it's a matter of luck. Uh, and Richard Timing actually has a very good example showing that it's about all about preparation and mindset. And luck favors a prepared mind, as Louis, Louis Pasteur has said uh, hundreds of years uh, before uh, uh, Richard Hamming. Right? I've, and I think he concludes with, I've told you how easy it is. Furthermore, I've told you how, you, how to reform. Therefore, go forth and become great scientists. This is delivered uh, to Bell Labs researchers. So that's why uh, you need to know the context. It's really a speech uh, delivered to researchers, aspiring researchers, let's say. That's, uh, and that's one of the reasons why I would like you to read this and internalize it. Okay. Okay. I think this is a really great time to take a break unless there are questions. Uh, I will wait for some time. So somebody raised their hand. Uh, uh, could you, uh, would you like to speak? Um, that'd be great. Can you hear me? Uh, okay. I don't know how, uh, who, who's, I can hear you. Uh, who's talking? Oh, uh, okay. Um, hello. I'm on Zoom. Okay. Yes. Um, I can hear you. Yes. Great, great, great. Um, so just the question is about hardware security. I'm curious about like how impactful it is because like theoretically the impact is huge especially like as we move like to like things like autonomous driving and such mm -hmm. but um i guess practically what is the impact of it because like because like first firstly like you know in the past maybe i'm not sure how impactful it is because i haven't heard of hardware attacks on the scale of computer viruses so software attacks yeah and then also like in the future right even if you do make a like a theoretical breakthrough in hardware security it will be adopted because i saw somewhere that you had um, found the Rohammer many years ago, but even now um, it has not been like sort of like solved or like prioritized maybe by the DRAM companies. Yeah, yeah. So that's a good question. So I think hardware security is very broad and there are many different types of attacks, et cetera. Uh, so I, uh, I would argue that it's quite impactful today. One of the reasons why you don't see uh, the same scale of attacks like software is because it's not easy, right? Software is uh, relatively easy to attack uh, and it's easy to create a virus, for example, or uh, yeah, malware in general. And it, almost everybody can do that today. Uh, but it's also easy to defend against as well. So once you have an attack in software, it's, or once you have, employ good prin principles, uh, you can defend against software relatively easily, let's say, compared to hardware. The, the, the difficulty in hardware security is, yes, attacks are also harder to do. That's one of the reasons why you don't see these large-scale uh, attacks. They're also harder to detect that someone is doing, meaning someone, someone can be doing it and you may not know it easily. And they're also harder to defend against. So that's one of the reasons why uh, it doesn't look as widespread as software uh, attacks. But I, I think uh, that should not, uh, uh, I guess, let us, to, uh, let us think uh, that it's not high impact. It's quite high impact on the contrary, uh, I would say. And you've seen this in, in Meltdown and Spectre. People are still trying to solve it. And you also see it in Rohammer. Uh, people are still trying to solve it. Now, I should say that uh, uh, the uh, Rohammer, uh, the fact that Rohammer and Meltdown and Spectre, Meltdown is sold, I would say, but the, the fact that Rohammer and Spectre are not sold today doesn't mean that it's because people, uh, it's because they're not important or people don't take it seriously. I think uh, uh, people recognize it, their, uh, the importance of these hardware problems, uh, but they're not always, let's say, uh, methodical about solving them. 
uh, they may not know exactly how to solve them. That's why part of the part of the reason is why uh, uh, part of the that's uh, that's why some of these things are research partly. But sometimes they may think that uh, they have the solution, but they don't really have the background necessarily uh, to prove that their solution is good. And that's what happened with Rohammer, for example. I would say uh, we will discuss Rohammer in a little bit more detail to get into the issues. But DI manufacturers wanted to solve the problem, but they didn't have the background or uh, the right mindset and the fundamentals of uh, providing secure designs. Okay, does that make sense? Yes, that makes sense, thank you. Okay, cool. Yeah, we will talk about this. These, these are very good questions. That, uh, we will talk about these more. And also there, there are other inter interesting issues in hardware security. By the way, somebody's saying my video has stopped. Is that uh, correct? Oh, okay, I don't know why. Uh, let me see. My computer is having difficulty, I guess. So let me turn it off and on again. Is it better now? Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Maybe uh, you can you can shout out these things uh, if if it bothers you. I I don't always see the uh, chat uh, while while talking. Uh, maybe TAs can also uh, let me know. Okay, uh, I was going to mention one more thing related to that question. Basically, uh, there are other hardware attacks that are quite interesting also. And these are uh, today, uh, some of these are called supply cha chain attacks, for example. Uh, for example, if someone is manufacturing your hardware and that party is not trusted, they may insert uh, Trojans into your hardware, uh, meaning uh, they may insert something into your hardware that will uh, act upon uh, as a trigger and maybe do some harmful things in the field, uh, uh, whatever time. And I think this is, this is also a real issue uh, because uh, of the way computers are designed today. Uh, there's almost no single uh, entity that can design the entire hardware stack uh, design today. Uh, and that leads to other kind of hardware security problems. And, and again, that also has similar issues to other hard, uh, row hammer and meltdown inspector, even though it happens at a much more manufacturing or logic uh, layer, these attacks are very hard to design, very hard to detect, and uh, also very hard to defend against if you don't have the right fundamental principles. Okay, any other questions? I guess, do you, do you still have a question, Jing Yuan? Um, no questions for now, thank you. Okay, yeah. Okay, any other questions? Uh, okay, then let's, uh, I would suggest, let's take a 15 minute break. Uh, let's be back at, I think exactly like 2.40. Uh, that way people in the room can get uh, some breathing room, maybe without their masks outside also. Okay, I will see you in 15 minutes.
I don't, I think, I think it was too powerful. Everything. 
Thing at all? Yes, I think. But we but we have some feedback now. We should fix that. But the the this is the desk mic. Testing the desk mics again. Trying again. Now there's less feedback, I think, but there's still a bit. Can you hear us clearly? I think I think it should be working now.
But now, can you hear us? Or is there echo still? Hi, Jan, can you confirm that it works? I think I heard you fine, Juan. Very good, thank you. Are you using the uh, built-in microphones to desks? Yeah, we were able to get them to, to work. OK, excellent. So everyone can use them now if they want. OK, cool. Okay, maybe we should slowly get started. Let me delete this new slide. But now I don't see your video. Meaning the video of the room. Is it there? Oh, okay. Okay, now I see it, sorry. Yeah, it was Juan's video earlier, now it became Jaws. Okay, cool, let me do this. Okay, I think we can get started for the second part of the uh, lecture. I'm going much slower than I intended to, but that's okay. Uh, we don't have any real set material to cover, if you will. It's more important to have the discussions and questions. If you're, uh, if you have questions, okay. Now I'm I'm going to jump into uh, an overview of computer architecture uh, today, let's say, and hopefully I'll motivate you a little bit more on why studying computer architecture is important, especially today, uh, because recently uh, the field of computer architecture, in my opinion, has exploded in the sense that there are many, many really interesting exploration directions. Uh, that uh, people are working on and enabling new applications is one of them for sure, but enabling much more efficient systems than another one of them. And we're going to cover some of these interesting developments uh, in recent years. I'm also going to give examples from some of our research as well as some of other uh, products that are out in the field. And as recently as like a few months ago, uh, we have seen a lot of interesting developments. Okay, so before we start, I think I will I should formally define what computer architecture is uh, uh, from our perspective. It's really wait a second. Okay, it's the science and art of designing computing platforms. Again, this is the expanded view of computer architecture. It includes the hardware, the interface, the system software, and the programming model. Uh, and it's not just science. I should also say perhaps engineering, but in my view, science and engineering are together. Uh, it's not just science and engineering, but it's also art. Uh, and art plays a big role uh, in it as well, because a lot of the design decisions that you make are not really easy to evaluate uh, completely scientifically, because you're really designing systems for future that are going to be used like 20 years later, let's say. And how do you figure out what's go uh, how your system is going to be used 20 years down the road? Applications will be different. Users will be different. Environment will be different potentially completely 20 years later, right? That's why art plays a big role in it as well. But certainly science and engineering are important too. Of course, the goal is to achieve a set of design goals in the design of this computing platform. And there could be many design goals that uh, one can come up with. For example, uh, you may want to have the highest performance on earth on three important workloads. And this is kind of the design goal of a supercomputer, right? When you design a high performance supercomputer, uh, you're really designing for highest performance. Usually there are other design goals as well, but this is the most important design goals. And we're going to talk about some of the other design goals, if not today, then tomorrow. Uh, it, uh, also, it could be the design goal that, the design goal could be that you may want to have the longest battery life at this form factor that fits in your pocket with cost less than some francs. Right? This is usually the design goal of a mobile system like a cell phone potentially. Uh, today. Of course, there are other metrics that you optimize for as well, but the, the, these are the critical factors, let's say. 
Or you may want to get the best average performance across all known workloads at the best performance slash cost ratio. And this is usually what general purpose computers are designed to do, like a uh, mobile, uh, not, not mobile, but like a desktop or a laptop, for example. Uh, and general purpose processors are usually designed to do this as well. But even in the general purpose domain, to achieve this, you usually need to add some specialization to the architecture today. For example, even in the general purpose systems, we want GPUs, right, today. GPUs used to be very fancy in the past. Today, they're an integral part of any computing environment, if you will, because it's necessary to achieve the performance requirements of the users, right? Meaning that contributes to the best average performance in this bottom case in a general purpose system. So clearly all of these systems are very different from each other and you can come up with many other potential design targets and design goals. And I'm gonna show you some examples of it as we go along in this lecture. But, uh, and in the end, designing a supercomputer is different from designing a smart smartphone, but many fundamental principles are similar. Both of them may be employing GPUs, right? In fact, uh, the, the top performing, the most energy efficient supercomputers today are employing a lot of GPUs. Mobile phones today are also employing GPUs. So in a sense, they have similarities, right? I'm just picking on GPUs at this point, right? Uh, but you can pick on any other component also. Uh, in fact, uh, mobile phones are already employing AI, machine learning accelerators, right? If you have seen Apple's uh, M1 chip, it has machine learning accelerators. Other chips also have machine learning accelerators. And that's true for supercomputers going forward as well. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, some of these. Uh, Okay, somehow there's some clicking issue with my computer. Okay, it already clicked, but okay. Let's take a look at some of these platforms. Uh, is, my, is my video okay or is it stuck again? Okay, good. Good to have good, this direct feedback. Uh, okay, clearly you may know of these different platforms. These are some uh, more, let's say, less conventional platforms, but computing plays a huge role here. Uh, thermals and... Uh, safety, uh, all of those are important in these platforms over here. And battery life is critically important, of course. This is another joking platform, clearly. Mr. Bean is uh, riding his own self-made, self-driving car. But I think it's good to think about the design uh, goals as well as the constraints of a self-driving car that would truly uh, ride you like this, right? Basically, if you would like to be able to ride a self-driving car, how would you trust it, right? I think it's good to think about these issues. Ideally, we would like to be able to do this well, maybe not everyone wants to do it, but you would like to be able to trust your self-driving car like this, right? By the way, if you haven't watched this episode of Mr. Bean, I would recommend it. It's, it's a funny one. Uh, this is another self-driving car, relatively old. Uh, you can see that there's a lot that goes into the back of the car uh, to make it work. Uh, and still, we're not there yet. I mean, we have been working on self-driving cars for some time now, and we're still not there in terms of the safety standards, although we're getting, we've gotten a lot better, right? And we still need to do a lot more in terms of uh, not only safety, but also efficiency uh, as well. This is another platform. It's a data center. Complete different design goals, clearly, right, compared to uh, the previous one. Uh, somehow my computer is a bit slow. Sorry about that. Uh, and this is designed for more general purpose workloads. You can run anything on it. Uh, building blocks are similar, but the way you design things are clearly uh, very different, right, over here. This is one of the fastest supercomputers of its time. I haven't got a chance to update the slide. You can see this is from 2015. This is Tianhe 2 in China. This may have been surpassed by other supercomputers right now, but it looks similar to a data center, but it's very different in terms of its construction and the goal. Uh, cost is less important here. Cost is very important in a data center. Here, it's also important, but much less important. Here, performance is really the most important thing. Of course, performance is coupled with efficiency. So you need to really have high energy efficiency to get the highest performance in these platforms also. This is a more recent platform. Uh, this is Google's Tensor Processing Unit. It's designed to accelerate machine learning inference tasks uh, that are heavily employed uh, at Google's data center. Uh, and you can see that this is really a systolic array. If you've taken digital design and computer architecture, you've seen what a systolic array is. Data gets pumped from the left it flows through these accumulators over here. And in the end, it gets stored in the buffers over here. So you can essentially, you can do a matrix matrix multiplication in this systolic array. You may want to uh, go and watch systolic array lectures. I think it's fascinating. We may actually have electron systolic arrays later on 
uh, in this course as well, but it will probably come later after we cover memory. Uh, but if you're not patient enough, feel free to go and watch the systolic array lectures. And Google introduced this specialized accelerators for, accelerator for machine learning so that they can be much more energy efficient and cost effective uh, and also higher performance in the machine learning inference tasks. Uh, specifically, this was designed for neural networks uh, at the time. Uh, they've later expanded, as we will see in the fourth generation uh, soon. But uh, it's such an important application uh, today that accelerating it with software techniques was not enough for Google. Google clearly is a, traditionally a very, very software-oriented company. Right? It's a systems company. They don't do hardware in general, right? but they, they do hardware significantly now. Well, there was a mobile for, uh, end of uh, Google who did hardware, but it was not the major business. But right now, it's the core business of Google, the data center business, is also doing hardware, as you can see. Uh, and the reason is, uh, again, it's difficult to get the highest performance and energy efficiency on these important workloads that people care about or Google cares about in this particular case. And they have to design across the stack, meaning they have to design the software for this accelerator now. They have to design the compiler for it. Uh, they have to design the system surrounding it. And clearly they have to design the hardware to accelerate it. And they have made the choice that this was a good choice for them from a business perspective. Uh, it, would, it would essentially uh, improve their performance and efficiency as well as lower their cost. Uh, that's why we see these accelerators. And this is, uh, I think, uh, an example of this cross-layer design, the hardware-software cooperation across the stack that I was mentioning uh, earlier. OK, uh, this is TPU v4. Uh, well, somehow, uh, I don't know why. Yeah. OK, this is uh, TPU v4. Sorry about that. And this is the fourth generation of the TPU. You can, say, you can see that it has changed a lot. Now it's targeting a lot more applications. It's targeting training and not only inference. Basically, you can train large machine learning models using a cluster of uh, these tensor processing units. You can see that it's very, very capable, 250 teraflops uh, per chip. Uh, you're seeing a board over here. Uh, and you can see that it's targeting new machine learning applications, even compared to TPU3, which I didn't show. Computer vision, natural language processing, recommender systems, reinforcement learning, that plays Go. Google has published a paper that co that's called AlphaGo that talks about how you can, uh, how, how a computer can automatically play Go and be, uh, at a human level. In fact, I think it beats humans using the reinforcement learning principles. And I think this is a, a very fascinating thing, but it was not enough. Software is not enough. You really need this accelerator to make it fast. And the, uh, again, this is uh, the latest example of Google's, Google's tensor processing unit, but other companies have also released similar units. Okay, another example, this is uh, another machine learning accelerator example. This is Tesla. Uh, I, I don't think this is the latest chips they have, but this is the latest picture that I could find that was nice. Uh, and you can also see the YouTube video that they have uh, delivered on the design of this chip, if you're interested. But you can see that uh, this is essentially a machine learning accelerator, maybe not as powerful as Google's, uh, but it's, uh, they have two copies of it. Essentially, they have redundancy uh, because they want to be safer, let's say. At least that's how they advertise it. And there's certainly some truth to it. Uh, basically, if one of these chips fails, the other one can take over. Or they can figure out a fault uh, by comparing the outputs of these two chips. This is called dual modular redundancy. Uh, essentially, it's a very fundamental redundancy principle to uh, make sure you can detect at least a single failure in one of the chips. Uh, of course, you can generalize the concepts uh, to n modular redundancy, right? Uh, you can have n different module, n, uh, n copies of the same module and do a voting on them to decide uh, whether you're executing correctly every single instruction, but that's, that becomes more expensive. But you can see that a car company like Tesla is also dry, uh, designing its own chips, as well as the software infrastructure that goes into these chips. Okay, this is another uh, startup company, actually. Uh, that has designed that something that looks like this. And this is interesting because uh, it has 2.6 trillion transistors. And you can see that it has, it has 46,000 millimeter square. So it looks, it's like this big in my hand. So it's not a, a chip as you know it. It's really a wafer scale chip. Basically, they have the entire wafer. They don't really cut it into smaller chips. They use the entire wafer as a chip, let's say. And they interconnect all of these different parts of the chip using some sort of inter interesting interconnect. And this consists of many, many machine learning accelerators, many, many small single instruction multiple data units, which they call cores, 
according to them, they have 850,000 cores, but these are very simple cores. And again, the goal is to accelerate machine learning uh, inference as well as training. And what they have uh, found in this chip is that well, the, way, the reason they designed it this way is they wanted to have a lot of computation capability as well as fast access to memory at the same time, because you're training on large amounts of data and you want to operate on large amounts of data quickly. You want to customize the computation to do matrix multiplication very efficiently, but you also want the computation unit to have very fast access to memory. So they wanted to get rid of the data movement bottleneck we talked about earlier. That's why they designed this chip, uh, which has a lot of SRAM uh, memory in it. It's, uh, I think, according to what they said, it's 18 gigabytes. Uh, but don't quote me on it because this is the second version. In the second version, they may have a larger one uh, than 18 gigabytes. So they basically have lots of compute units that are really close by at least 18 gigabytes of memory. And that enables the machine learning inference and training tasks to be much, much faster. And you can see that this is happening right now. Uh, for, to, of course, to, to take advantage of this, you need to have the software stack. You need to write your algorithms. Uh, you need to have a nice compiler that compiles into it. You need to have, uh, you need to orchestrate the data movements. There should be a dynamic runtime component as well. So again, this is a hardware software co-design like we have discussed uh, earlier in terms of our axiom. You really need to co-design across the hierarchy to get the highest performance and efficiency. And this is already happening in industry, as you can see, certainly for machine learning workloads, but we will see other workloads uh, as well. This is another workload. Uh, these are genome sequence analysis, uh, uh, genome sequencing engines. They're called Oxford Nanopore uh, minions, let's say. Uh, and you can attach it to your laptop or cell phone. Essentially, you can sequence genomes using this. And at this point, people are uh, designing accelerators, FPGA-based accelerators for it. And we have been doing a lot of early research on this topic. In my opinion, this is going to be the future. And in the future, we will have these uh, genome analysis accelerators that can do all sorts of things, similar to what machine learning accelerators do in a very limited way. In G machine learning is a relatively limited domain, if you will, at least the way uh, these folks approach it. They usually restrict themselves to some sort of neural networks. But genome analysis is much larger, so you need to have much more capable accelerators uh, going forward, in my opinion. But this is fascinating, and we will talk about uh, different sorts of accelerators in these lectures. This is another example. This is a processing in memory engine. Uh, this was an idea that was proposed as early as 1960s. Why don't we do, we have memory, we have processor. Why don't we have processing capability inside the memory such that we don't move the data that much? Uh, now it's real, if you will. You can see that this is uh, 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 something that we have been working with. Wait a second, something, okay. Okay, that's better, yeah. You have, uh, different, uh, you have different CPUs, but you also have processing in memory enabled memory meaning you can actually offload computation to it. And the data is immediately accessible to computation. Uh, and of course, this requires, again, a software uh, uh, stack on top of it. You need to have uh, programming. You need to have compilers that enable this. Uh, and we have written a paper related to it. And we are going to cover that uh, in later lectures, because this is, in a sense, uh, maybe uh, you can think of this as another revolution in computer architecture. The I call it the data-centric or memory-centric revolution, we're becoming much more memory-centric uh, in the designs because we're re recognizing how important the data movement problem is, and we want to minimize the data movement. And this is the upmem architecture. I didn't say it, but it's, it's, it's called the upmem architecture. And you can read papers about it, but we're going to cover it in this course also. But this is something exciting because this happened in 2019, and we have a new incarnation of it in 2021. Uh, if you think about it, if you were taking this course in, in 2010, for example, you wouldn't even see this. Uh, people may not even be talking about it in your course. If you, if you had taken my course, I would be talking about processing in memory. But uh, in general, uh, courses don't take into account the latest research, as I mentioned earlier, but we do take into account later research. But you, wouldn't, you certainly wouldn't have seen a real uh, device that could do processing in memory. But now we have them and we can analyze them. I'm going to go show you more examples of this in this lecture and later lectures. We're going to have specialized, uh, we're going to have lectures on different types of computation in memory as well. This performs one type of computation. Basically, it puts the processor close to memory, but it doesn't really integrate computation functionality inside the memory cells. So there's another approach to this, which is fundamentally even lower energy and higher performance. But we're going to see the differences as we go along in this course. I think this is fascinating. And 
I believe that people who are studying at this time are kind of lucky to see this sort of uh, explosion in different types of architectures. Like when I was studying computer architecture, I was certainly fascinated about it, but I, I was not exposed to this sort of explosion in computer architectures. GPUs were not even uh, there yet, let's say. They were just uh, getting into the space, but GPU revolution also happened more recently, like after 2006, uh, certainly. Uh, and certainly GPU revolution has enabled machine learning applications uh, to become uh, strong because the first work uh, that accelerated machine learning to a, a level that's almost on par with humans it was published in 2012, where they were able to do the inference on GPUs. Uh, uh, maybe we'll mention that later on. Okay, but uh, I, th I think this is hopefully gives you an overview of where we are in computer architecture today. It's an exciting times, uh, and it's, it's, all, it's all been enabled by new ideas. So uh, I think I'm not gonna repeat this again, but- uh, I can't hear you anymore. Oh, okay, you cannot hear me anymore. Let's see what happened. Okay. Can you hear us? Oh no, can you hear us? I can hear you. Um, no, because okay. we, we can't hear ourselves. I can hear you also. I can hear. Um, on How about your... now? Is it good? I can hear. Uh, can you, uh, How about now? People say it's fine on Zoom. Okay, maybe, maybe we'll wait for uh, the room. Uh, okay, thanks for the feedback. Uh, I guess all Zoom people. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we're we're good now. I think. Okay, I think yeah. Some this, uh, I guess disconnect happened. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about uh, this. Uh, what is computer architecture? Again, you can read this, but it's the science and art of uh, designing, selecting, and interconnecting hardware components and designing the hardware software interface to create a computing system that meets. Many different goals, functional, performance, energy, cost, reliability, security, safety, et cetera. You can add many, many metrics over here, basically. Okay, so uh, I, I think I've given you examples of why uh, expanded view is important. We really want to expand the view of computer architecture, and this is already happening. Uh, and I think it's going to happen a lot more into the future also for many different applications. We're going to talk about genomics, for example, uh, multiple times in this course. Uh, hopefully, it's going to be interesting. And I think it, it's, it's good for you to think about uh, other applications also, like in what other domains we really need computing. I think medicine is one example, uh, not, uh, not just motivated by the recent COVID-19, but also many, many other reasons. Uh, health is really important for everyone. And I think we need to design better systems that, uh, that are better for medicine going into the future. Okay, this is again a quick, a relatively quick slide, hopefully kind of obvious, but we would like to enable better systems by studying computer architectures, uh, by making computers faster, cheaper, smaller, more reliable, more secure, more robust. And to be able to do that, we would like to be able to advance, uh, exploit advances and change in underlying technology circuits. And I'm gonna give you some examples related to that also. We're gonna talk about emerging memory technologies, for example, which is going to be hopefully fascinating. We would like to be able to enable new applications. For example, uh, virtual reality or lifelike 3D visualization was not possible some number of years ago. Today, we're getting much closer. Self-driving cars, uh, personalized genomics, personalized medicine. There are many, many other applications here. It's, uh, uh, people just need to dream basically of what they need to do. Of course, you can enable good applications versus bad applications. Uh, we're not going to deal with issues of ethics in this course or morality, if you will. Uh, we're gonna deal with technology and technology can always be used for good or bad, right? In the end. But technology is agnostic uh, to ethics, if you will, or, or morality. Uh, hopefully people will use it for the good. Otherwise we have a lot of danger. Uh, we want to enable better solutions to problems. Uh, clearly software innovation is built on trends and changes in computer architecture and machine learning revolution is a good example. I've already mentioned that uh, real machine learning revolution happened after 2012 because people were able to use GPUs to do inference and later training of large models. Well, small models to begin with and then large models. And they were able to show that using GPUs, they can relatively quickly uh, do uh, machine learning calculations and uh, as a result, reach human level accuracy in image recognition. In fact, uh, the first paper that was published in 2012 uh, won the ImageNet competition. Uh, uh, at, at that, uh, that year. Uh, clearly that's a, a problem that people wanted to solve and machine, uh, computer architecture combined with machine learning enabled that solution. Uh, 
And certainly in the end, we want to understand, uh, also we want to understand why computers work the way do, they do so that we can have better lives, right? Okay, so I think today uh, is a very exciting time to study computer architecture because as I said, uh, we, uh, we have actually many, many different potential system designs because industry is in a large paradigm shift because you cannot solve everything in software today, basically. And I think people have realized that. If, uh, and maybe I, I should make the bold claim over here that if you, if, you, uh, if you are optimizing your software and gaining a lot, uh, that means that you're not at the cutting edge. Uh, my definition of cutting edge is that you optimize your software a lot, and now you don't know what to do. And at that point, you actually do hardware software co-design. So if you, uh, for example, go and do a startup, start a startup, and your software uh, can get faster by 10x with modifications, then you're not at the cutting edge yet. <laughs> of course, you may be solving a good problem still, but you may not be at the cutting edge uh, in the end. And I think a lot of uh, uh, what we do is really hitting the cutting edge right now. For example, the cell phone I have, uh, it's an iPhone, but many cell phones have similar properties. They're really doing this hardware software co-design uh, and some companies are better suited for it because they have the control of the software as well as the hardware, and they can optimize across the stack clearly. So there are many difficult problems to solve. Uh, they're motivating what we are doing right now or caused by uh, what we're doing. Clearly, there's a huge hunger for data, new data intensive applications. We have reached the limits of power, energy, and thermal constraints. Uh, of course, cooling is related to this, but uh, these have become problems. Complexity of design has become a big problem recently. And technology scaling difficulties, like Rohammer is one example we will talk about, but there are many technology scaling difficulties in terms of reducing the size of the transistors uh, right now. That has become much more difficult and it's not buying us performance, for example, uh, as we go along, or it's causing even more power problems. Memory bottleneck, as we discussed, and we will discuss a lot, reliability problems. And some of these things also cause programmability problems. If you switch to an architecture that's data-centric, for example, maybe your programming needs to change. If you have a lot of heterogeneous accelerators, again, your programming needs to change. You cannot have the same mindset saying that, oh, I write a single-threaded program and it magic magically executes and takes advantage of the hardware. Those days are gone. You really need to understand what goes on in the hardware so that you can write a much better software that can execute on these engines. And we will cover some of these issues, certainly. And certainly security and privacy issues uh, that we have briefly touched on. And there are no clear or definitive answers to these problems. Uh, that's why studying computer architecture is exciting today. And these problems affect all parts of the computing stack uh, if you not change the way we design uh, systems. Uh, so if you look at the computer stack, uh, there are many new demands from coming up from the top, meaning users and people who want to solve problems. There are many new issues at the bottom. Uh, technology scaling issues, for example. Users also change a lot. They demand different things. And there are many different types of users. It's very diverse user world out there. And again, uh, computer architectures are kind of stuck uh, uh, to adapt uh, to all of these demands. That's one of the reasons why reconfigurable architectures that can evolve and self-adapt and self-learn over time are going to be more important, in my opinion, into the future. And we're going to see some examples of this as we cover different lectures using machine learning principles in the design of computer architecture such that different computer architecture components can learn from past behavior, can customize themselves to the user choices, can customize themselves to the programs that are executing are going to be a lot more important going into the future because these demands are very fast changing. And as I said, computing landscape is very different from 10 to 20 years ago. Uh, Okay, I've, I've, uh, I've already mentioned some of these things, uh, but essentially every component and its interfaces, as well as entire system designs are being re-examined today. We don't have a single solution like the a general purpose Intel or AMD processor or ARM processor. That's the way to go. No, today everything is very heterogeneous, including memories, including processors, uh, and including interconnects as well that are kind of not shown in this particular picture, uh, including the memory hierarchy as well. Okay, so there is a lot more interesting th things to do going forward. And I think uh, my axiom, I will repeat it over here. I'm not gonna uh, go over it again. We really need to take the expanded view and co-design across the hierarchy. And that's already happening, but we need to do more. Let me give you some historical perspective to it also. And I think this is really interesting because it brings us to uh, a lecture that was delivered uh, by Feynman, Richard Feynman, who's, uh, uh, who's a famous, perhaps one of the most famous physicists uh, of our century. Uh, and he wrote 
uh, he basically delivered this talk uh, that's called there's plenty of room at the bottom. What does this mean? Basically, uh, if you think about the computing stack that I showed you earlier, oh, okay, uh, yeah, bottom is really about physics and electrons and devices, right? And the top is, I guess, software and problems, algorithms, etc. Feynman, uh, yeah, this is the slide that kind of was kind of missing for whatever reason. Zoom is going too fast on me. Uh, but basically, uh, he delivered this lecture in 1959, and basically, he even considered the direct manipulation of individual atoms uh, such that you can do synthetic chemistry uh, much better. Uh, basically, can you somehow directly manipulate at the higher levels at an atomic level uh, such that you can actually uh, use these atoms to do things for you? And uh, later on, this uh, talk was taken by nanotechnology uh, folks, and they basically were trying to achieve something similar things, maybe not individual atoms, but they were trying to reduce the size of every single thing to the nanoscale, nanometer scale. And they actually uh, took, uh, took inspiration from Feynman's lecture saying, oh, we can do a lot more things if we can somehow figure out uh, what we can do at the bottom. We don't fully understand, for example, uh, how, uh, how, to, how to manipulate uh, different quantum states in atoms and different uh, interactions between atoms. And that's what he was getting at, basically. And I think this is still true. Uh, like he was particularly interested in quantum computers as well as uh, nanoscale things. And he also uh, presented very interesting ideas like swallowing the doctor. Uh, with these nanoscale technologies, you can actually uh, build surgical robots. Clearly, uh, wait, let me sw swallowable surgical robots, the really small surgical robots. And these were some of the things that he uh, mentioned uh, very important to look at at the bottom. Uh, and I think uh, this is still true. Uh, even though we may actually be hitting technology scaling limits, uh, or we're, we're very close to technology scaling limits in terms of uh, today's CMOS logic, or DRAM, uh, or maybe flash memory, I think there's still a lot of room at the bottom. We don't quite fully understand and take advantage of. There are other technologies that we have not exploited fully Carbon nanotubes are one example of this. Uh, maybe phase change memory is another example of it. Uh, maybe different quantum computing technologies are other examples of this. Uh, so we still need to look at the bottom. Now, some people argue that there's no more room left at the bottom, meaning devices, physics. I strongly disagree with that. I think there's still a lot more to do, but we may need to change the problem, change the formulation of the problem, like uh, what Hamming would suggest, right? Maybe you should not just consider the existing technology, but think about some other technology that can enable more progress at the bottom. Now that's uh, recently some other folks have written this article that's called, there's plenty of room at the top. Uh, basically these folks are a bit pessimistic uh, in terms of uh, uh, technology scaling. Uh, basically they say semiconductor miniaturization is running out of steam as a viable way to grow computer performance. There isn't much more room at the bottom. Okay, uh, let's take it for granted for now. Uh, if growth in computing power stalls, practically all industries will face challenges to their productivity. Nevertheless, opportunities for growth in computing performance will still be available, oh, especially at the top of the computing technology stack, software, algorithms, and hardware architecture. So this is the part I agree, I agree with. I mean, certainly uh, there's a lot of room for improvement in software, algorithms, and hardware architecture uh, to take advantage of what's at the bottom. And that needs to happen a lot more, and that's happening right now. But I do, I do not agree with uh, this uh, characterization. There isn't much more room at the bottom. I think that's uh, maybe looking at uh, the problem in a more myopic view uh, by just considering existing technologies. I think if you think about future technologies and the understanding that we can build of the fundamental way of doing computation with different types of things, uh, like maybe molecular computation, uh, maybe quantum computation, uh, maybe carbon nanotubes. I think there's still a lot of room at the bottom. But I would, I would recommend both of these articles to read, actually. Well, uh, I guess Feynman's is not an article. It's really uh, a talk. But maybe uh, I will pose uh, the axiom uh, like this. I think there's plenty of room at both at the top and the bottom. But you can get much more so when you communicate well between and optimize across the top and the bottom. So you may actually improve at the bottom with new devices. You may actually improve at the top with new algorithms, new architectures, but you really need to co-design so that they can meet each other. And that's where the real power of hardware software co-design across stack design comes in. And I think this is going to be the philosophy of this course also. Hopefully you will see many more examples of this. Okay, hence we have the expanded view that I mentioned earlier. 
Okay, any questions so far? People are silent. I can see they're intently watching. That's good. <laughs> I hope uh, I hope everything is clear. Okay, I don't see any questions, so I'll uh, continue. Oh, just a quick question. Sure. Um, so um, the one thing you mentioned was that um, softwares, I mean, computer architectures move from like a one size fits all to more of like a, a heterogeneous space. And so that, it's, that sort of implies to me, um, I guess, decentralization. Mm -hmm. So when you have like in a specific application area, you know, that needs um, some kind of co-design, um, maybe that means that, you know, practitioners in that area will want to co-design their own chip um, specific for their needs. So the mm -hmm. question is like, say it's like, say there's a startup that wants to manufacture their own chip for some specific application area. Um, what is the barrier of entry right now for that? And um, what's the trend in that? Space? Yeah, yeah. The yeah, that's an excellent question. I think uh, it depends on uh, the application, basically. Today, for example, if you want to build a startup on machine learning accelerators, you can relatively easily get funding. Uh, so a barrier to entry in, in terms of machine learning accelerators is not uh, high. Uh, in fact, it's, the, it's perhaps the easiest it has been uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in many decades. Uh, so uh, I think if you have a good idea in terms of machine learning, AI acceleration, or even genomics acceleration, uh, then I think you can actually, uh, the, the barrier to entry is relatively low. You, need to, you just need to convince someone to fund you, uh, of course. But the support you will get is relatively high over there, as we will see also in later slides. But it depends on the application, of course. If you want to accelerate, uh, I don't know, some other application, even though it may be important, uh, it may not be as easy uh, to enter that space because, uh, well, if you want to do a startup, if you want to do research, that's relatively easy, right? You need to uh, show your prototypes. But if you want to do a startup, you need real money uh, to actually employ people and do a real business. Uh, like uh, machine learning is easy, but if you want to do, for example, database, it may be harder, right? Because there are more traditional applications, if you will. But if you want to combine graph analytics and machine learning, that could be another application that's very that could be very appealing uh, to people in the world. Hopefully, that gives you uh, an answer. There are, of course, business aspects to it also, right? It's not just technical. You will need to convince people who uh, are going to fund your startup for some number of years. You need to convince them uh, the viability of the application. And today, there is no problem with the machine learning applications, of course, and graph analytics also, I would say. But some more traditional applications you may have difficulties with. Does that make sense? Yeah, I guess like, yeah, that's interesting. Cause I, I was thinking, I guess that you would say something like sort of like the an analogy for 3D printing to manufacturing, mm -hmm. which is bringing the costs down. But I guess what you were saying is actually rather, uh, you like approach it, I guess, the answer from the, the other perspective, which is increase the amount of capital you have access to. So you can use the existing manufacturing technologies. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I think uh, 3D printing is uh, very nice, but uh, we don't, uh, so maybe at some point we will get to a point uh, where manufacturing hardware will also become uh, cheaper and easier and much more automated. Then I think uh, uh, a lot of applications will take advantage of it. And I think we are slowly getting there, but we're not there yet. That's why the applications are quite important and the impact the applications will have uh, are quite important at this point. Okay, cool. Any other questions? Okay, so now let me move on to some more close trailer design examples and also some other examples uh, that we will uh, perhaps cover uh, in this course, but clearly we're not gonna be able to cover everything. I'm just going to flash some slides over here, uh, but basically cross layer design is important and uh, our group has been doing a lot of research in this topic also, but also other groups have been doing research. These are some things that you may get to see or read about, uh, but certainly, if you want to do efficient neural network inference or, or training, um, you want to cro do cross-layer designs. And this is one example of that cross-layer design that takes advantage of uh, approximate nature of dynamic random access memory so that you can have much more energy efficient neural network accelerators. I'm not gonna go over the key ideas. At some point we may cover this, especially when we talk about memory, but memory is actually a big power consumer in neural network inference. And this work really targets that with a cross-layer design. Uh, Again, similarly, sparse matrix multiplication, sparse matrix, matrix vector multiplication or sparse matrix matrix multiplication are important operations for machine learning, graph processing, et cetera. And by designing 
software compression and hardware acceleration together, you can actually get to a much better place, uh, even in general purpose processors, basically. Uh, we, as I mentioned, we're doing a lot of work on genomics. And this is an example of a cross-layer design that uh, uh, accelerates approximate string matching by having software changes as well as hardware changes to uh, approximate string matching algorithms. So it's like a specialized accelerator for essentially approximate string matching, which is an important problem, not only in genomics, but also in text search, for example. Uh, this is another example. You may again get to see climate modeling. Again, it's very data intensive application. And uh, if you want to accelerate it, uh, you want to actually uh, minimize the data movement as much as possible. And this is a real design that uses the FPGAs to accelerate stencils, complex stencils in weather prediction or weather modeling uh, near memory. Again, I'm throwing these at you. I don't expect you to understand everything, but these are good examples of cross-layer designs, in my opinion. Another example, and these are some applications, for example, the, the previous question kind of ties into it, right? The previous question was asking if you want to do a startup. Startup is a different domain. You need to convince some people with a lot of money. But in research, you just need to convince yourself and others that it's an important application. And maybe someone will later pick up the idea and do a startup on it, right? Uh, in research, for example, time series analysis, I think it's a very important application uh, uh, that is used in astronomy, for example. And basically, if you have lots of data that's streaming into you, how do you do that analysis online very quickly to make sense of, sense of the data? How do you find the anomalies that you're looking for, et cetera? This all boils down to some sort of time series analysis. And this is a time series analysis accelerator uh, near memory again. Again, it's a hardware software co-design. And if you're interested in more of this in our perspective, this is a, a paper that we have written. Uh, at some point, we may read it, uh, that talks about FPGA-based near memory acceleration of modern applications, including climate modeling and uh, genomics, uh, read, read mapping in particular. OK, and now that we've kind of gotten into genomics a little bit more, uh, I think this is a fascinating domain. Uh, clearly, genomics is going to be more important going into the future as we're experiencing with COVID-19. In fact, in my opinion, we're not doing enough with COVID-19. We should be sequencing genomes a lot more to understand the mutations, to understand the interactions uh, with different uh, drugs, interactions with different vaccines, et cetera, variants. There's a lot to do over here. Uh, the reason we're not, well, there are multiple reasons why we're not doing it, but the technical reason why we're not doing it as well, in my opinion, is because uh, the computers we have are not efficient enough to do the genome analysis. You need very heavy analyses to do, comparing many, many genomes, for example, in metagenomics. But the computers are not efficient at doing that. So I think we need to accelerate it. And this is not just COVID-19, clearly. This could be a life-critical situation where a, a, a doctor needs to administer some drug uh, to a person, and they need to figure out the best drug because they don't have time. How do you actually do it, right? And uh, genome analysis, personalized medicine is really built on that premise that you can personalize the treatment and the way you personalize the treatment from a genomic perspective is really analysis of the genome and its interactions with different uh, treatment methods. And that requires a lot of extensive data analysis. And this paper gives you an overview of the efforts in this direction, both our efforts and others' efforts. And if you're interested in this direction, I think uh, maybe machine learning revolution is already happening and happened. In my opinion, there is a revolution that needs to come in genome analysis and medicine uh, and its interaction with the computing. But that's a field that we don't fully understand yet. OK, uh, so graph processing, graph analytics, as I mentioned, is important. I'm going to mention this later again. And mobile workloads is important. These are different kind of acceleration and hardware software co-design methods. Uh, let me briefly talk about some, uh, some things that are limiting us also. Uh, I think it's good for you to give this broad overview, get this broad overview in this lecture. Uh, what, what are we limited by uh, today in many of the designs is the, our interfaces. Uh, meaning we have a lot of rich information at the higher level. Uh, the user, the programmer, uh, even the software itself has a lot of uh, information in it. Uh, if you analyze the software, you can actually uh, know what the access patterns are, data types are, data structures are, different code optimization, et cetera. But this information doesn't get communicated through the narrow hardware software interface today. Uh, at least in general purpose systems. In FPGAs, you need to communicate it in some way, of course, but that may be not so easy for everyone. But in the general purpose systems, we have a huge bottleneck over here. Software, at the higher levels, you have a lot of information. At the lower levels, it gets funneled through a very limited interface. 
which basically tells the hardware what are the instructions, what are the memory addresses. Everything else gets lost, if you will. As a result, hardware doesn't have a lot of context to do optimization. And I think this is a huge limiting factor today in the design of computing architectures. Hardware software co-designs try to get rid of this funnel, basically, as much as possible. But in general purpose systems, we have not had a lot of efforts to get rid of that funnel. And I think in general purpose systems, we should also get rid of that funnel. Basically, uh, this is a work that we call expressive memory, but it doesn't have to be memory. It could be computations as well. Basically, we would like to somehow convey higher level program semantics, access patterns, large scale computations, uh, what does the program require? What is the intent of the programmer, potentially? What is the quality of service that you require from this computation, for example? How long should it take to execute, et cetera? And if we communicate all of that information in a nice way to the hardware, the hardware can internally optimize a lot. And I think there's a lot of power to this interface. And recognizing that this interface and the communication of information is the bottleneck is important. Okay, I'm not going to go through the solution in detail, of course. You can read the paper. And maybe at some point, we're going to cover the paper also. This may be one of the recommended papers when we talk about memory systems, for example, which will be a good chunk of the first parts of the course. But uh, th this table from the paper gives some examples, for example. Uh, let me pick one. I, I think I like compression, for example. If you want to do good compression uh, uh, in hardware or software, uh, you cannot do it in either place, basically. Uh, if you want to do good compression software, uh, if you don't get aid from hardware, you're not efficient, uh, or you cannot accelerate the compression optimizations. If you want to do good compression in hardware, you may not have enough context because all of the information that you need to do compression very efficiently is lost in the interface. But having a better interface, you can do better in both sides, basically. For example, uh, simple things like communicating the data types that you're compressing. Is that integer? Is the floating point? Is a, is a, is a character? Communicating the data properties, is this sparse data, is this pointer data, is this index data, or more, more things. Even just these two enables you to use different compression algorithms for different data structures and different data types and different data properties. And that enables significant improvement in compression efficiency and also compressibility of programs. Today, they're not communicated, but with a much better interface, you can communicate that information. I am just talking, picking one row over here. The rest is, you can read, but there, there's, there are many, many rows that can be added over here based on your imagination and creativity as a computer architect. Okay, so I'm not going to go uh, over that in more detail. We'll hopefully talk about it. Similar thing exists in GPUs. Even data locality is not communicated well between the software and the hardware and GPUs. And if you actually do this communication, you can get significant performance benefits that this paper shows. Again, my purpose is not to show you the, exactly how it's done in this lecture. At some point, we may actually talk about exactly how it's done. But to give you the general perspective that communication is a problem between the software and the hardware, and by solving it, you can actually improve performance and efficiency significantly. Okay, this is something I will spend a little bit time on because I think this is fascinating also. This is a work that we did with Microsoft uh, about seven years ago now. But basically, uh, one problem is that memory is hard to scale. Memory is very costly. And if you want to keep everything extremely reliable, it becomes just more costly. You need to do more testing. You need to make sure that the memory has error correction codes, et cetera. And it becomes even more costly going into the future. In fact, this paper at that time analyzed the cost of a CPU versus memory. It's 50-50, basically. The cost of a system is 50% memory, 50% uh, the CPU. Today, it's much worse, probably, uh, because you need to have very large amounts of memories in data-intensive applications. So this paper recognizes one opportunity that's, again, hardware software co-design. And the idea is if you know the memory error vulnerability of different types of data that you use in different applications, you can design a much more scalable memory system. So what is the vulnerability? Meaning uh, it means that some data is very vulnerable uh, to memory errors. If you get a bit flip in memory, the program crashes or the program doesn't run correctly. It gives you incorrect output because the bit flip happens in a critical data structure, right? Uh, it could be uh, some important uh, pointer link, for example. But some data, you don't care almost. Basically, the quality of your video degrades a little bit, but you're going to overwrite the data anyway uh, soon. So that goes away. So there's a wide variety of vulnerability uh, levels of different types of data in different types of applications. The question is, can we somehow take advantage of this observation? Clearly, this is a semantic level information, right? The vulnerability is uh, 
observed by the user, it affects the user's quality of service. And the user needs to communicate this somehow, or the programmer needs to communicate this somehow. So if, you can, if, if they can somehow classify their data as vulnerable and tolerant, this is of course binary, right? There could be shades of gray in between, but let's assume binary right now. You can design your memory system such that it can have different components or different types of memories that can cater to different types of data. Vulnerable data goes to reliable memory. Tolerant data goes to low cost memory. And these may employ different techniques. This is called heterogeneous reliability memory. Uh, later, there's been a lot of work that actually explores this direction also, but this is the first work that coined the term as far as I know. But reliable memory can be designed in many different ways. It could have error correcting codes. It could be very well tested chips. As a result, it's going to be expensive. But tolerant uh, data goes to low cost memory. That doesn't have a lot of error correction. It's less tested. It's good enough, basically. And if you do this, if you can, uh, for example, neural networks, some of the things uh, is by, by nature, uh, they're very statistical, right? In fact, there's a lot of noise that you can add to neural networks. They can still learn. Uh, some other noise that's coming from the hardware may be okay also. And we exploit that principle in some later works, not this work. Uh, but basically, neural networks are another good example of taking advantage of this sort of hybrid or heterogeneous memory system. A lot of your data that's not critical uh, that you can still learn with, even though it may have some errors, can go to low cost memory. But a lot of your data that's very critical, like the control that happens in the neural network, such that you can actually aggregate uh, the results, uh, that needs to go to the reliable memory, potentially, right? I just did that partitioning for you, but there are other works that explore this later on. But clearly, you can see the design over here. And this enables a much more scalable memory system. We have some results in the paper uh, that, at that time, we were interested in reducing the cost. And you can reduce the cost significantly by getting rid of error correcting codes uh, in many of the memory system and while achieving good availability. But this is a hardware software co-design problem. It's across the stack problem. You have a lot of these applications and data. You need to somehow characterize and classify application memory error tolerance and essentially uh, designate different data and applications as tolerant and vulnerable. And it could be, again, a spectrum over here. And then map the application data to the heterogeneous reliability memory system enabled by software hardware cooperative solutions. So clearly, the operating system needs to be involved. The user and the programmer needs to be involved. And the hardware designer needs to be involved so that uh, they can design reliable memory and unreliable memory, different types of memory for different types of vulnerabilities. So hopefully, this gives you an idea of the impact uh, you can have uh, uh, if you actually are able to break the barriers and design across the hardware. Uh, across the hardware software stack. OK, uh, that's another example. Another example is rethinking virtual memory. I'm not going to talk about this, but we may have actually a talk about this later. I think uh, uh, virtual memory is actually a very nice hardware software co-design that has been extremely successful for decades and decades and decades. But it's probably time to rethink it because it's becoming uh, very hard to manage. Uh, uh, how many of you have uh, studied virtual memory? Just give me a show of hands. OK, not everyone. OK, OK, good. I think most people have studied virtual memory, so that's good. If you have not, again, you can refer to my lectures from last year. Uh, we're not going to cover virtual memory in this uh, particular class uh, so that we can focus on advanced topics. But uh, virtual memory, because of the metadata that it keeps, is not scaling very well uh, uh, with very large amounts of virtual memory as well as physical memory. So we need to rethink it somehow. And this, again, uh, needs to be a hardware software co-design. And if you're interested, this particular paper introduced a fundamental rethinking of uh, the virtual memory fr framework uh, by doing a lot of things in hardware, by the way, but of, co of course with software support. OK, uh, now I will, uh, I guess maybe I should ask, are there any questions? This is a good time for questions also. Otherwise, I will uh, continue giving you some examples of interesting things that are happening in computer architecture. We covered some of them, but I would like to cover some more because it's exciting. OK, there's one more question. Uh, please go ahead. Uh, so another question is um, about, I guess, Moore's law in the space of uh, machine learning accelerators, because it seems like Moore's law has sort of stopped for memory in terms of just like brute force decreasing the size of the cells. And I've heard similar things are happening for processor speeds because like they're um, because of the size of the 
transistors. But then like for the hardware accelerators, for example, I remember when Tesla revealed their accelerator like two years ago, it was like way ahead of everybody else, like NVIDIA and everything. And then like, and then I guess like now, then um, I, um, you showed the example about Google, who's actually but then gone and surpassed Tesla's, a double Tesla's teraflop capacity. So I'm wondering in terms, in, in, in this space, right? Like, do you think the Moore's Law will continue and how so? <laughs> well, that's a, that's a good question. I think Moore's Law uh, um, is still continuing. Uh, uh, Certainly, and uh, but we need to again uh, reformulate the problem a little bit. So clearly, we're putting more uh, more transistors per millimeter square, right? And that's what Moore's law is about, basically. The device density uh, doubles uh, every eighteen months or so. Uh, maybe that's slowed down uh, a bit uh, compared to the past because it's becoming increasingly difficult to. Uh, uh, keep up with the same pace, let's say doubling every 18 months, maybe it's doubling every two years or two and a half years or whatever it is right now. I don't know the exact data, but it's still continuing. I think people are still finding it economically viable uh, to do it, except it's getting more difficult. And I think it's going to continue for some time in the accelerator space also uh, uh, until we hit the limits basically where it becomes economically infeasible or economically unreasonable uh, to reduce the size. Uh, of uh, the transistor in this particular case, right? Uh, but I think, we're, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, we're getting close uh, there. As I mentioned with technology scaling issues, this is a technology scaling issue. We're getting closer to that point. Will it when will it happen? I don't know. Uh, are, we are we much closer today than five years ago? Yes. <laughs> uh, for in DRAM, uh, I, should, I should also say, uh, address your comment on memory. Uh, Yes, DRAM scaling has become uh, has uh, has been a bigger problem than logic scaling, and that's why we're going to dedicate a lot of time uh, to memory in this course also because memory is also fundamentally a bigger bottleneck today than computation because we know a lot of techniques to do computation faster, but we don't know a lot of techniques to do memory better, if you will. Uh, even memory, in my opinion, has not reached the limit of Moore's law yet. Again, it's slowed down in memory because you need to reduce the size of a DRAM cell, for example, and it's become extremely difficult to reduce the size of a DRAM cell given the same amount of time, let's say. Uh, so things are slowing down. Uh, but I don't think it's finished yet. And we're seeing a lot of reliability problems because things are much, much smaller today. Rowhammer is one example. In logic, we're going to see a lot more reliability problems also. We're already seeing some reliability problems in logic as well. And that's, that is going to be important to solve uh, going into the future. When it stops, uh, then the question is, what, what comes next, right? Uh, certainly, when scaling stops, uh, you cannot potentially have larger memories. Uh, economically, at least, it'll be unreasonable, potentially, to have larger memory chips uh, or larger chips in general with more transistors. Uh, I think uh, the avenue is really two directions. You either uh, you should invest in new technologies, emerging technologies that can enable better scaling. Uh, and also, you should invest in the cross-stack solutions, right? Even though Moore's Law uh, may not be buying you more transistors. You can take advantage of a given transistor much better if you're doing a hardware software co-design in a nice manner, right? That, that's why I think these folks who wrote the article, uh, uh, there's, uh, there's plenty of room at the top, said that, okay, we're at the end of the bottom. We should focus on software architecture and hardware architecture, right? And they were right from that perspective. If you stick yourself to an existing technology that is not scaling anymore, yes, architecture becomes much more important. And I think architecture is important regardless because emerging technologies, if you, uh, even if, if, if you say, okay, I have this new emerging technology that's great and that's going to be much better than CMOS technology that's not scaling very well or the DRAM technology that's not scaling very well, that's good, but you need to design architectures that take advantage of, uh, of it also. That's why architecture, computer architecture is very, very exciting today. So hopefully that answers your question. Okay, I take that as a yes, so I'm going to move on. <laughs> okay, uh, any other questions? Okay, let me cover some interesting things happening in computer architecture today. Uh, I've covered some, but there's a lot more. And performance and efficiency are one example of why they're happening. Basically, we have an even more drive towards performance and energy efficiency because we want these applications to become uh, even higher performance and higher efficiency. And this is one example. Uh, if you took this course five years ago, you wouldn't see this. It happened in 2019. This is a persistent memory device. 
You can actually buy it. It's Intel's Optane persistent memory. It's a non-volatile main memory. It's based on phase change memory technology. We will talk about in the emerging memory technologies lecture. And it's non-volatile. Uh, Intel calls it 3DX point, but it's really fundamentally phase change memory principles. Uh, essentially, this gives you very large amounts of memory at reasonably low cost. And it scales much better. It doesn't have as many technology scaling issues as DRAM has today. Uh, so it has clearly a lot of advantages, right? It can scale better. It can give you large capacities at low cost, lower cost than DRAM. Of course, as manufacturing processes become more efficient, that will become lower cost. Uh, and also it's non-volatile, meaning now you can actually use this as if you were using a disk, for example, it's persistent, right? You can make your programs, uh, program data more persistent. Uh, whenever you turn off your system, data doesn't go away. And it's almost as fast, fast as DRAM. At least in the current incarnation, it's not as fast, but it's going, it's, it's reasonably fast enough. So it's still orders of magnitude faster than hard disk, for example. So I think this is something exciting because it's going to enable very high performance and efficiency on data intensive applications that need to require persistence of data. And uh, this could be a lot of applications in high performance computing, for example, uh, but also many other applications that require that sort of persistence. And I think this is, uh, this is again happening right now. We're going to talk more about this in this course. That's why I'm not going to mention the properties of phase change memory, for example, right now. But I will also mention that enabling something like this is a long road. Uh, you need to enable uh, the devices. You need to enable the architectures. You need to enable the software stack to take advantage of it. I think we're still not there at the software stack, uh, but and also maybe not in the architecture. And also we can do all, a lot more in the devices. So there has been a lot of device level work to enable phase change memory since 1990s for example, and uh, it's, it got enabled in 2019, you can see. So from the device level perspective, it could be 20, 30 years. From the architecture perspective, this is one of the first papers uh, that uh, we happened to write actually while I was at Microsoft Research, uh, while I was transitioning actually, but most of the work we did was at Microsoft Research uh, where we examined uh, phase change memory as main memory and we proposed uh, using phase change memory to replace DRAM. And that's essentially what got realized 10 years later, almost 12 years after the research. And we argued uh, that this is a good viable option to uh, examine. So you can see that uh, architecture research uh, takes time, certainly. You're, you may have an idea and it can get incorporated much longer. And you need to be resilient, clearly, to enable something like this also. Uh, and certainly, there's device level research that I'm not even talking about here. You can read this paper to see the device level research examples that are even earlier than our architecture level work. So hopefully this gives you a perspective on uh, research as well, because uh, research can actually have an impact, but the impact may be delayed quite a bit over time. I think 10 years is not bad, actually. It's still within a lifetime. OK, and this is a shorter paper that, uh, and a more accessible paper that discusses uh, uh, the technology and future of main memory, if you're interested. We're going to talk more about this uh, as we go along. OK, this is another example that I mentioned. This was first wafer scale engine by the Cerebra startup in 2019. It's a machine learning accelerator, as I said. It's wafer scale. And uh, you can see that the first incarnation of it is 1.2 trillion transistors. OK, two years later is 2.6 trillion transistors. So you can, you can see that Moore's law is still alive. Uh, maybe it's taking some more time to get to double the transistors. But two years is not too bad again. right? You can see that comparatively. Uh, to the largest GPU, it's much larger. So maybe it's, I guess, 60, 60 times larger, right? That's a lot. Uh, and I've, I've already given you the reasons why they designed it wafer scale so that they can get large amounts of compute and large amounts of memory at the same time in a specialized accelerator that's operating using SIMD, single instruction multiple data principles, and enabling wafer scale. Going wafer scale enables this. Of course, going wafer scale cause a lot of challenges also, right? How do you power up this chip? It's huge. Uh, it requires a lot of power. How do you cool it down? Again, it's huge. I don't have the picture over here, but they have a big box to enable power and cooling into it. Another, another issue is when you have a fault in somewhere in this chip, how do you actually continue the operation uh, in, a, in a resilient way, in a graceful way? And that becomes a bigger issue compared to a smaller chip that because the probability of failure on the entire application increases as the area footprint of the chip increases in this case, right? 
So they have actually mechanisms to route around the faults uh, as they describe in uh, some of their presentations that I linked over here. Okay, this is another example I mentioned earlier. Uh, it's happening for performance and efficiency reasons again. Uh, this was uh, uh, machine learning applications. This is more general purpose. You can actually uh, offload any application to uh, processors inside the DRAM bank over here in the upmap modules. This is processing in DRAM. And you can see these are real. And we have been experimenting with them. And you can actually, you will, uh, Juan will give some talks related to this. This is actually a talk that he delivered in the last incarnation of this course. He's going to deliver a, a more up-to-date uh, um, description of the OpMem engine and also what we have learned from studying it. But you can see that inside a DRAM chip, you have a processor. And the processor looks like a pipeline that you may have studied in a past class, right? We're, going to talk, we're not going to talk about pipelining in this course since, since it's basic, uh, since it's an advanced course. But you can see that this is essentially a small processor inside the DRAM. So what they have done, what these folks at UPMM has done is attached a small processor next to each bank. And now you can offload your computation such that your data movement is very little. Uh, very little meaning that data moves very little, right? It doesn't move over the power hungry interconnects to the, pro uh, to the real processor. Well, I shouldn't call it the real processor, to the uh, compute centric processor, let's say. I, I would call this a more data centric or near data processor. Okay, if you're interested in learning more about this, you can fetch earlier if you want some of the papers that we may cover, uh, actually we will cover in later lectures. And they're also, this was also one of the Safari live seminars, the first Safari live seminar. And as you can see, there's a lot of interest on this topic and industry is quite interested in processing in memory solutions. Because again, uh, it's, it's, it's important to change the paradigm such that you can be much more efficient and high performance going into the future. Okay, there's more analysis of the OpMem engine. So these are some recommended talks. Uh, I mentioned earlier, similar approaches have been employed in FPGAs. And this also, with FPGAs, you can now have configurable processors and reconfigurable processors near memory. It's not inside the memory bank, but it's much closer to memory. And uh, you may have heard of this, but Samsung, a large company, recently introduced their function in memory DRAM which is essentially very similar to the OpMem architecture where you have a simple processor next to each bank in memory, except their processor is very specialized. Uh, so you can see that they want to specialize for artificial intelligence. Somehow my computer has slowed down a lot. Sorry about that. Yeah, basically they want to accelerate AI or machine learning since uh, they want to make money out of this, I assume, though they, they're using AI and machine learning. But essentially, the ideas are very similar. We're going to talk more about this in the course, but they want to accelerate, multiply, and accumulate operations inside the memory. And they don't want to move the data. They want to, Basically, they're moving the multiply and accumulate operations near data so that data movement uh, gets reduced in the system such that they can do this uh, efficiently across all memory banks. So there are, there are multiple benefits uh, they get. One is... Uh, they, they re reduce the data movement from the memory to the main processor. And they also can parallelize computation across many memory banks. So if you have 200 memory banks, for example, you may have 200 units that are doing these operations near data. Okay, and again, I'm not going to talk about this in uh, detail, but clearly there's a pipeline associated with it, smaller pipeline than UpMEMS pipeline, but it's based on fundamental pipelining principles again. And you can see that there's a simple instruction set that they can execute. It's not just multiply and accumulate, they want to move the kernels that are dominated by multiply and accumulate. So they need to do also some jumps and exits, et cetera. Uh, and if you're interested, you can read some of the papers, ISSCC paper, and some of these may be uh, recommended readings that you may review later on. And this is real. Uh, and more recently, they've also introduced this uh, to accelerate a recommendation system uh, application. So recommendation systems are essentially ads, right? When you go to Facebook, Google, et cetera, uh, based on, uh, or Netflix, I guess, based on what you've done previously, or Amazon, based on what you've done previously, they recommend things for you, right? Sometimes they're terrible at these recommendations, but uh, people are trying to improve these. So essentially these are machine learning systems that, they, that, that recommend things to people. And uh, Samsung has recently uh, used the FIMDRM architecture uh, in a real system and introduced these big, like big boards essentially, that can do computation inside the DRAM chips. So you can see that this is becoming real and it's becoming really interesting. And you can attach it to uh, 
Intel systems such that you can do near memory computation uh, for this machine learning task. Uh, uh, and maybe we'll, we'll also talk about this since they have written a paper about it also. But this is happening and it's real and it's processing in memory. Uh, we're going to cover processing in memory a lot uh, in this talk, just to give you a very quick overview. As I mentioned, there are two approaches, processing near memory, processing using memory. As I said, this is an old idea. Processing near memory is a very old idea, actually. Processing near memory was proposed in 1960s, late 1960s. I don't have the paper here, but I'm going to mention some of the work that we have done. And more recently, we have been revisiting it since the 2010s or so. And uh, essentially, a lot of these approaches uh, are happening right now after some time, right? I will also mention that. So this is uh, one of the first papers that we have written on accelerating graph processing, for example, near memory. It has a lot of similarities to uh, the approaches that I showed you earlier in real systems, but it's from the work was done in 2012, 2013 time frame, and the paper was published 2015. So it takes time basically. Uh, okay, there are other works that I'm not going to go over, but uh, you can see that uh, processing in memory is heavily being examined today in GPUs as well. And also in tough computations like linked data structure traversals as well. And uh, methodology of it is important. What to offload uh, near data is going to be very important. And this is a very important research problem as well. And I'd recommend you potentially start thinking about it because we're going to talk about it in processing in memory lectures. And we have been working on it as well. The other approach to processing in memory, which I should also mention is processing using memory. And I think this is fundamentally different. So processing near memory, as I showed you, you have a memory bank, you put a uh, processor next to it. The memory bank fundamentally still stays for data storage. But in the idea of processing using memory, the idea is, can we use the memory bank for also computation? So can it be double function, multi-function basically? Not just storage, but while I'm accessing the storage, can I also do computation it at the same time? And that's the power of the idea. Can, we, can I actually use the fundamental uh, properties of the device uh, to, do, to do computation? And we have been also looking at this. We're going to talk about that. This has uh, been done in DRAM. This is actually one of the first papers uh, on DRAM. There's an earlier version of it also. Uh, and uh, I'm going to flash some of these. And we have uh, there recently, we have actually developed frameworks so that we can do it end to end. Uh, and we can actually ex ex uh, do uh, complicated operations as well. So this is going to be fascinating in my opinion, but we don't have time today to go into it in a little bit more detail. And data copying is also important, data copying initialization. And it, uh, for, for us, actually, it all started with the realization that you can do data copying initialization with very, very low cost inside the DRAM by exploiting the connectivity of the different rows. And this is a very simple idea uh, that has enabled a lot of exploration in processing using DRAM space. We're going to talk about it when we talk about computation in memory. Uh, and later, we realized that you can also do computation on top of this, like and or not and majority functions. Okay, data movements is also important, increasing connectivity, uh, fine-grained copies, uh, interbank copies. You can also do interesting things inside DRAM by exploiting the computation uh, analog nature of DRAM. You can, have, you can have physical unclonable functions, device fingerprints. Again, we will talk about that later on, perhaps, when we get to it. You can also have true random number generators inside the DRAM uh, by exploiting, again, quantum-like randomness properties uh, that happen uh, when you reduce the latencies in DRAM and you have uh, randomness inside the sense amplifiers uh, in, in, uh, in sensing the noise. So I think this is fascinating. Basically, you can build a security infrastructure by exploiting the analog nature uh, of the devices. And again, I'm talking about DRAM over here, but there's also a body of work uh, that discusses all of these issues uh, for non-volatile memories, emerging memories, like phase change memory, uh, magnetic memory, uh, and some other types of uh, memristors uh, and different types of emerging memory technologies and also flash memory technologies as well. So uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this course, we're going to talk a lot about DRAM because DRAM is still the dominant technology. Uh, but uh, keep in mind that the fundamental ideas are applicable actually to many other memory technologies if you tweak the ideas such that you can customize them to different memory technologies. Okay, so that brings me to the end of very, very quick introduction to what's really happening today. So processing near memory is definitely happening today. Processing using memory, I think, has some more time to go. Uh, although some of the things are relatively easily doable, like row clone is relatively easily doable, but uh, operations uh, like general, general operations using memory 
will take some time to take because here you need to change the memory uh, array a little bit uh, to enable those operations. And we will talk about the practical aspects and adoption aspects of it when we get to these lectures. So, okay, if you're interested, uh, we have written a lot of reviews and overviews uh, for processing in memory. This is actually, a, I think, a 40-page uh, paper, uh, a book chapter that we wrote uh, to describe why processing in memory is important today and uh, what's, uh, what we should do to enable it. And there's another one over here if you're interested. And uh, there are also talks that we have delivered. If you're interested, again, uh, you can take a look at them. Uh, any time. But we're going to cover a lot of, the, uh, essentially all of the material in these talks, in this course, in different lectures. Okay, but if you're, if you're impatient for some reason, you can certainly watch uh, prior lectures from prior semesters. And this also gives you an idea of what may be coming in later lectures. We're certainly going to talk about computation memory, near data processing, memory controllers, and also uh, these new architectures that are real that you can actually uh, do, do real programming hands-on today. And Juan has a lot of experience with, along with some other folks in my group, and they're going to share their experience. Okay, and there, there's certainly emerging memory technologies. We're going to touch on how to uh, do in-memory computing with emerging memory technologies also. Uh, how do they enable, emer for example, some emerging memory technologies enable matrix vector multiplication in the analog domain uh, relatively easily. And we're going to talk about that uh, in later lectures. Okay, somehow my uh, Zoom is very slow. Okay, uh, I think I've already uh, given you these examples. Uh, I'm not going to go over it again, uh, but uh, just mention, I will just mention that, well, uh, I guess this gives you an example of the generations of TPUs, tensor processing units. This is generation two, generation three, generation four. Today we're at generation four. You can see that almost every, uh, uh, well, that, that's, that should not be 2019, by the way. This should be 2000. Uh, 21. Uh, yeah. Uh, but you can see that things have been improving significantly. But fundamentally, it's a systolic array. You can see that there's a matrix multiply unit, 64,000 matrix multiplications. This is uh, TPU1, the first generation. Later generations have improved that. And you can do that matrix multiplication almost at once, very quickly. That's why these accelerators are very powerful. Of course, to enable this, you need to set up your data nicely. And uh, we may talk about systolic arrays later on. But Again, these, this is just one example. There are many, many more to come, in my opinion. There are many, many other AI ML chips. Cerebras, I already mentioned, uh, and almost all companies are doing this right now. Uh, and this is actually from 2019. The companies that are doing AI chips copied from this particular GitHub. In 2021, they have increased significantly. And I believe they're going to increase uh, even more. OK, I think this is a very good time to stop. Uh, we're almost out of time anyway. but. I'm happy to take any questions, if you have any at this point. And tomorrow we will start with, hopefully, uh, we'll, we'll continue with some more interesting things. Any questions, either in person, online, YouTube? Oh, OK. Um, hello, Professor. Uh, Hello. I have a question. So uh, I know that nowadays some manufacturers are putting memory into the chip, such as Apple M1. Mm -hmm. So I mean, this approach um, by directly cutting down the distance between the processor and the memory seems to be easier than putting some dedicated processor into the memory. Mm -hmm. So what do you think of this? Well, uh, the, uh, yeah, that's a very good question. But they're not putting it inside the chip. So inside the chip, they are putting SRAM. They're putting it into the package. Basically, what they're doing is uh, they're reducing the distance, as you said, between the processor and memory. Uh, but fundamentally, there's still data movement that's happening across those energy-hungry interconnects. So uh, yes, this is an easier approach. And that's why exactly uh, they're able to do it relatively easily. Uh, but uh, And it's reducing the problem a little bit. But it's not fundamentally solving the problem. There's still data movement uh, that happens between the memory chip and the processor chip through the interconnects. And some of these uh, data moment is very uh, energy hungry because the bandwidth between the memory chips and the uh, processor chips uh, are also increasing due to many memory controllers and the use of high bandwidth memory, for example, in some chips like GPUs. So it's, 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 it's helping the problem partially, but it's not really solving it fundamentally, I would say. 
if you want to solve it fundamentally, you really want to get rid of the interconnects uh, between the computation uh, and memory. Let's say heavy interconnects. <laughs> yeah, got it. Thank you. Okay, cool. Okay, I think I, there's one more question on YouTube. I will take it and then maybe we'll be done. Uh, do you see FPGAs playing a major role in ML acceleration in the near future or are they too slow? Well, I think uh, they're good to examine for sure. Uh, they can be too slow in the current incarnation. If it's a full FPGA, yes, they can be too slow, but they are also very customizable. So I think uh, they may make up for the slowness with parallelization that you can do in the FPGA uh, as well as the customization that you can do in the FPGA. But there's nothing uh, that says you cannot combine the ideas. Uh, you can have partially reconfigurable logic inside memory also, for example, right? That can enable some of the customization and parallelization benefits of FPGA-like fabrics uh, inside the memory. So I think the idea is actually compatible. Okay, I think if there are no more questions, uh, we should probably end it here today. And uh, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. And feel free to introspect and prepare any questions. We can uh, handle them uh, whenever tomorrow. All right, take care, everyone. Bye.